Well, good afternoon, everyone. Cynthia Tomain with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining us today as we take a look at hunting major turning points in the grain markets. Now, today's presentation has been um, or is being sponsored by the CME Group. So before we get over to Tim, I'd like to introduce Barbara Schmidt-Bailey, who's with uh, Broker Services at the CME Group. It's all of Barbara's efforts that's brought Tim uh, to uh, or uh, for today's presentation. So, Barbara, let me go ahead. I'm going to put these on your introduction slides. If you can unmute your phone, we'll um, take a look at the slides and then uh, get moving with Tim's presentation. So thanks for joining us, Barbara. I'm going to actually pass you the ball. Uh, Barbara, you're, you can uh, unmute your phone with that red icon that's next to your name. Okay. Thanks, Cynthia. Cynthia, the, uh, that button works like a charm. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to everyone around the globe for joining us today. As Cynthia said, my name is Barbara Schmidt Bailey with CME Group in Chicago, and we're very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with Interactive Brokers. I'm also particularly pleased to be able to welcome you to this very timely presentation with Tim Morge, Hunting Major Turning Points in the Grain Markets. As a trader and investor, you look for opportunity in the markets and a way to capture and profit from those opportunities. Futures are an extremely flexible product for expressing your market opinion and capturing trading opportunity. Furthermore, futures do have several benefits which you can consider as you are looking for markets to trade. CME Group futures markets consist of contracts, both futures and options contracts, trading on four separate exchanges, the CBOT, CME, NYMEX, and COMEX, which all together combine under the umbrella of the CME Group. They trade tw electronically almost 24 hours a day, providing traders an opportunity to trade market volatility any time of the day from anywhere in the world. And CME Group is part of a regulated industry under the U.S. CFTC and NFA, all which safeguards the integrity of the futures markets. Now today we are talking about um, agricultural products which trade on both the CME and the CBOT. Uh, it's a very wide number of products. Tim is obviously going to focus on the most liquid of these products. Uh, certainly with the drought, the, the drought that is going on in the U.S. right now, um, we are seeing a very high volume in our commodity products for the month of July alone. Average daily volume in our grain and oilseed futures increased 43, almost 44 percent and average daily volume in our in July for the oil seed um, grain and oil seed uh, futures options increased over 100 percent from the same period last year. Uh, there are certainly also a number of um, things that contribute to uh, increases in the price of the grains and oil seeds. Um, everything from weather, global demand, energy policies, macroeconomic factors. Tim will certainly give you much more of his opinion on those pieces and how they play a role in uh, our marketplace and what happens on a daily basis. Here again, just what I was saying with the volume charts, our most liquid products, uh, corn, wheat, beans, live cattle, and lean hogs are the most liquid of the products in our agricultural suite. I'm also going to put a uh, URL into the uh, chat window if you are interested in more information on what affects the grains, grain and livestock markets. You can take a look at this, what we call an infographic, which talks about the facts behind food prices. So today's presentation, Tim will be focusing on both the CME and CBOT grain, oilseed, livestock markets. For an in-depth introduction into these markets, please look for the archived recording from um, a presentation I think that took place about three or, three or so weeks ago with Interactive Brokers. My colleague Rich Jelinek, who is the director on our ag marketing team, uh, introduced those products. If you are not familiar with them, he reviews contract specifications, market participation, a number of fundamental factors that play a role in price movement in these markets, and it's a, a great uh, educational uh, 
a piece to watch. Many of you are already familiar with Tim Morge and his work, a longtime trader and member of the exchange. Tim generously devotes much of his time now to teaching traders and running his educational website and service at marketgeometry.com. This presentation, as Cynthia mentioned, is part of a year-long series with Tim as he presents his ideas and strategies for trading markets from gold to corn and oilseed to interest rates. We encourage you to look for archived recordings of Tim's past presentations as well as watch for upcoming events each month. Uh, next month, Tim will be taking a look at trading uh, precious metals. So without further delay, I'll pass the presentation control to Tim. I invite you to all enjoy the event, and thanks once more for joining us. Thank you, uh, Barbara and Cynthia. Cynthia, let me just uh, check. Can you guys all hear me? Because I've been fumbling the uh, phone here. Okay, good. Nice to see you all. I appreciate you all waiting uh, two or three weeks for me to reschedule. Um, Barbara uh, and Cynthia, thank you very much for for being patient. I hope, uh, well, I know it'll be worth it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something a little unusual this month, um, especially because we did reschedule. So it'll be well with your time, I think. So with that being said, let's just uh, get onto it. We're gonna do hunting major turning points in the grain markets. Um, one of the interesting things about doing something every month and having to prepare it a month or two in advance is you're not exactly sure whether something's going to be uh, topical or hot, um, so to speak. And obviously, this one has hit uh, hit the ball uh, out of the park. We're we're right again at the uh, at the at the top for grains. Um, not necessarily this will be the high point. I just wrote to Barbara. Um, beans in the twenties, anybody? Uh, we used to say when I was on the floor, beans in the teens, and of course so we'd almost never make it in a year. And now we can't get out of the teens. And it looks like we're about to make another leg higher, and we'll take a look at uh, at the charts. And one of the surprises I have for you today is I have homework for all of you, because this move may not be over. So everything I present today will have homework afterwards, and uh, hopefully you'll all participate. So let's take a look here. There we go. Um, I run uh, a website. I'm trying to give back to the community. Barbara's been helping me. I've been doing it since 1995. Um, I've been trading this is, I'm in more than 40 years and teaching professionals, more than 20. I'm in my 25th year, 25th year, Barbara. Um, and Barbara and Cynthia have been helping me for quite a long time. Uh, let's see, we're seven or eight years together uh, doing things with IB, if you can believe that. So uh, had a good run. Now I always enjoy it. Um, these presentations are always well attended, and IB is uh, probably the best educator out there. And I really appreciate being able to present for them, especially for the CME group. Um, this is a disclosure. Everybody has to have a financial disclosure these days when you speak. It's a good thing. Um, I don't have the Holy Grail. Nobody that presents anywhere or teaches you anything has the Holy Grail. I don't believe there is such a thing. Closest thing is hard work. Uh, get as much education as you can. Practice on a very either simulated trading or very, very unleveraged basis with money that you can afford to lose. Of course, not much. Not many of us have money that we can afford to lose. So. Please take your time, learn slowly. Learning how to trade does not happen overnight. One thing I would point out, which is always the truth, this is one person's experience, and your experience may differ and probably will differ. You have to decide whether or not any of these methods and any methods that you hear from anybody else work for you. I was lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Alan Andrews as my first mentor and um, there were a handful of people around him when he was alive. He passed away in 1987. And there's only eight, eight of us left. Uh, I'm the only one left that still trades and teaches. Um, I'm in my 50s, but it's because I, trade, I started so young. My brother introduced me to Dr. Andrews. And uh, most of the people that are left are in their 80s and 90s. And uh, I hope they have a, a good long time left, but uh, most of them are, are done with the markets at this point. So I always take time to give attribution to the people to help me. Dr. Alan Andrews was uh, certainly my first uh, large, large speculator mentor. Uh, and today, you're going to see a lot of the techniques that I developed um, after working with him. So we're going to start out with actually something that it is not technical analysis, but that you do need to know if you're going to be a long-term portfolio grain trader. 
And I learned this uh, while first just managing money at Commodities Corporation, which, of course, is now part of Goldman Sachs. Um, and then later on, I was uh, one of four people in the world that mentored and taught traders there. Um, and a lot of the top hedge fund managers passed through Commodities Corporation and uh, came through my office. And I was taught this by some of it by a gentleman by the name of Amos Hostetter. You can do a Google search on him and make sure you're not talking about his son who started the cable vision business. But Amos Hostetter was one of the best speculators probably in the last 300 years. Most people don't know who he is, but he was the founder really of uh, the, the key thoughts about risk reward. But he was also a huge campaign trader in grains, um, main potatoes, some of those things. So we're going to look at what I call biologics. And I'll use this as kind of a uh, a sifting methodism, method, no, methodology, excuse me, um, when I take a look at a market. So first we need to know, I'll answer questions afterwards, so just relax. Um, first we need to know, we're going to look at grains today. Um, I wish we had time to look at meats, actually. Meats are a lot of fun. Maybe Barbara will give me the opportunity, Barbara and Cynthia, to do meats a little bit later. But we're going to look at grains today. They're, they're just so... This is the perfect time, uh, or early June is also the perfect time. And let's take a look. It, most of you probably did not grow up on a farm. In fact, I didn't grow up on a farm. But my mother grew up on a farm, um, and her parents obviously were farmers. And I learned a lot about farming, not from being on a farm, but by talking to Amos and talking to other people at Commodities Corporation, people that were spread traders. Um, and they, at that time, it was the largest hedge fund in the world, and they were the largest speculators in these markets. And certainly I was one of them. I continue to be one of the largest grain speculators in the market when I'm active. So let's take a look. What I've done is I've broken out the calendar here. And basically crops come out of the ground no later than about the middle of November. They're actually mature somewhere in here, September-ish, but they're often left in the field because you get paid – for crops based on how much water is in them. So you want them to dry out. So if it's a particularly wet year, that's not the case this year, but if it's a particularly wet year or a normal year, you have to let crops dry out. That's why you see if you drive by farmer's fields, you'll see that the grain, you might say, oh my God, that corn is dying. No, the corn is just drying out. It's, it gets all, it gets white. It loses all its color. All the leaves are still on it. And uh, they let it just completely dry out. Same thing with beans. Beans wither. Uh, they turn from beautiful dark green to just kind of a shriveled yellow, even white if they live in the field longer. And they have to leave it in until enough of the moisture is out. Then when they get down to 3, 4, 5% moisture, then they'll harvest it. It'll be somewhere in here. Now, once they harvest it, we move into this portion of the calendar. The farmers have to clear off the stubble in the field. Some farmers actually go ahead and turn the field over. Some people leave parts of the stalk standing so that they won't get erosion. But all that happens somewhere in here before the field completely freezes and or if we get late rains in the year, puddles and fills with ice. Now, a funny thing happens around the world. There are lots of places that plant grains, whether it's Canada, Argentina, Russia, China. But these contracts really tra uh, trade based on American grain, and they really trade based on grain in the Midwest. So grains are generally sold off because the silos are full of grain. They get full here as the farmers bring them in. And then as the silos are full, anybody that's left that hasn't hedged their grains, the farmers, slowly has to go to the market and sell out their grain position. They have to sell it to the they can store it in the silo and pay a fee, or they can actually sell it to the silo, or they can hedge it at the CBOT. If they haven't hedged, eventually they will have to hedge or they'll have to sell. And that will weigh on the market if there's nothing going on, and of course that generally happens. Now, if we get you know, the warm and fuzzy feeling of a good crop going on, for example, in South America, you'll see grains start to sell off very, very early because there's all the crop left, whatever's left from America, and people trying to get their profits out there. You've got what's going on in South America, even if it's still in the ground. 
and that all means that somewhere in here we'll get a bottom, bottom in grains. If the grain market's not that great in South America or China, uh, the bottom may come somewhere in here. But you have to start paying attention, actually, in November. You'd be shocked how often the bottom is all the way in here. Even though the planting's not going to come, let's take a look. Planting comes in corn first. And farmers have a good idea what they want to plant, but they really don't know how much of each they're going to plant until they get corn in the ground. And if it's raining heavy, they might have to hold off because the ground, you know, their fields are full of water. And then it gets to be late June, they can't plant corn anymore. The season's not long enough, so they plant soybeans. So you'll see the two move back and forth. We're going to go into that in just a second. Once they get it in the ground, certainly no later than early July, it has to germinate. In other words, the plants have to come up and they have to grow roots. And then we take a look. If it rains too much, the roots can be weak. If it doesn't rain at all, the roots are very, very shallow. Um, and it's just it's a mess. They're not going to stand up. Um, if it's like this year, they get fried. Um, and actually, in this year, at some point July, in July, farmers were actually plowing under, getting their insurance money, just giving up. So you can take a look at this slide later on when you download the slides, and you'll see just basically what the calendar is. We'll go over it a little bit when we do some charts. Let me go to the next chart. Now, you can go. There's a bunch of places, both on the CVOT. Has this, this is basically, uh, we would call them a price board, a clacker board in the old days before even uh, LEDs. Of course, now they're, now they're just video. Uh, they actually used to be clacking back and forth each time they changed. Before that, they were actually written in pen. Now, you can actually go on the Internet and see the CBOTs. It refreshes instantly. You can see um, at several other websites. And these are e each of the actual trading months in soybeans. And I always look at Globex which shows you both the pit and Globex together. And the, most of the volume is Globex anyway, these days. Even though there is a grain pit, most of the volume is here. And if you're thinking about speculating, you want to look at the crops that are going to be harvested, not the crops that are already in the silo. So when I took this picture, which is in July, there was August of 2012 beans, September of 2012 beans, but I'm speculating in no November what we call Novi beans. And I actually was buying Novi beans when I put my position on. I don't want to roll each month because I have to go through gyrations to decide uh, whether it's the right time to roll, whether or not I'm getting the right price. And when I, if you're trading on one lot or five lots, it's different. But for the size that I trade, it's better off for me to just go right out to the month that I'm going to hold. By the time November 2012 comes along, I'm going to have liquidated because I don't want to take delivery. I don't want beans on my on my lawn, and it'd be lots of beans. So I speculate out here. And what I'll do is I'll take a spreadsheet, and I'll take a look at the relationship. So if I'm speculating, let's say it's, uh, no, it's after November, and maybe it's January, maybe it's March, I'll take a look at the relationship of the front month contract, which might be January or might be March, the contract that's closest to actual date I'm trading. And I'll take a look at that price versus November, and I want the smallest spread possible. Or if it's at a discount, which it is right now, a lot of times it's not at a discount. Here it's at a discount, so I want the largest spread because I want the biggest discount possible. And I'll watch it go in and out and try and get an advantage as much as possible. So take a look. If you could buy at 1270 and prices remain stable and you did nothing else, you might be able to harvest all the way at 16, so you get four cents, 400 cents in the four cents in the big sense, but 400 cents times five. It's a lot of money just by holding. If everything was the same, of course, nothing nothing is ever the same. But the first thing you want to do is get a feel for the spread and where it is relative to the front month, relative to the back month that you're trading. So November to say 2013, and see if you can find an opportune time to speculate. But the ultimate decision is always going to come on the chart. I'm not a fundamental trader in the sense that I get grain. Rep I used to, when I was at Commodities Corporation, we get calls five times a day from people that are out in the fields, even in the winter. And uh, one thing is clear now, that edge is gone because of the Internet. 
the information that I could get by paying somebody a million dollars a year, literally a million dollars a year, for good grain service gets spread immediately. It's, it's old news in 10 minutes. And a 10-minute edge in the grade, it's not worth it. Because I'm trading for months and months and months. So I just relax, find my place. I'll still pay attention to the spreads so I know where they are, and you should as well. But I'll take a look at charts. So let's, let's start there. So we're going to start out with weekly soybeans. Now this presentation this month is going to be a little bit different than what I've done in the past, and probably a little bit different than what I'm going to do in the future, because I'm going to show you a couple things. It's kind of a thank you. This has been uh, probably the most spectacular grain year that I've, that I've had. I've had some pretty good grain years, but I've had a number of positions, and we'll, I'll show you them, um, and managed to get in and out a number of times in each of these in each of these contracts, and uh, it's just been so wonderful. And then you were so gracious to wait for three or four weeks, I decided to uh, show you working charts and give you a couple things that I normally wouldn't show publicly. So I would give you one caution before we start down this road. We're going to start with weekly beans. And at some point we're going to look at daily beans. But don't make this mistake. I'm not suggesting that you should look at weekly beans to get an idea, then go to daily beans to drill down to get to highlight the idea and maybe zoom in on it. That's not at all what's going on here. You could make this trade on weekly or daily, and I'll show you the same lines on daily or weekly. And the reason I'm starting at weekly is because there's so much going on in the past, and we're going to base a lot of our decisions based on a very, very long-term chart. And again, you could just trade this off the weeklies. But a lot of you would be uncomfortable trading off the weeklies. So I, I, I'll transfer it onto the dailies, and we'll take a look at the dailies as well. But don't, you don't need to look at both. Please don't look at both. Pick whichever time frame you're going to trade. Do your analysis trade off of that. So let's take a look. So this is what weekly beans look like going in toward the end of the year, the end of 2011. You see, we had a huge run-up, as we did in all commodities. And then a great fall in July of 2008, as we did in all commodities because of the credit crisis. People that were carrying this, that were carrying this on, uh, on credit. Fund managers were leveraged. If you're leveraged, that means you have to pay for the credit. And banks basically cancel their credit line. So in oil, in beans, in currencies, a lot of people had long-only funds that were based on credit, and of course those people were forced to le liquidate. You can look at the week of July 13th, sounds ominous, doesn't it, um, in 2008, and you'll see this same formation uh, across the board in commodities. It's an amazing phenomenon. If you study commodities 20 years from now, you'll be studying this period. Then we recovered a bit, and you can see, in the big sense, we've been making higher lows all the way along, even though this spectacular spike is there. If it bothers you, just cut it out and paste the chart right here and forget this spike ever happened. But you can see we've been making higher lows all the way along. And here, even as we come off at the end of 2011, so as they harvest grains, we're not coming off real far. Now, as a speculator, obviously I'd love to buy grains down here. This used to be the old top. I'd love to buy beans down here. But it's been a long time since I've had an opportunity to buy down here. And so you have to wonder, is where do I want to get long? What's the long look like? Because, now I don't want to use the word new paradigm, the new words new paradigm. Every time I hear that, it makes my stomach kind of grumble. Um, but we're in, we're in a territory where we have to get more comfortable with higher prices. If you don't adapt, you die, right? Well, let's see what we can do with this. We're going to do some simple chart work. Now, just because it's simple, like I said, I'm, I've been doing this now for more than 40 years, and I've been trading grades that long. Just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's not powerful. And we're just going to mark a major swing low. It's a big bottom right here, and it's right before price began this big march up. Major swing low. Just circle it. You can go back and do this on, on your own. Recreate the chart. It'll help you. Major swing low on the bottom. Just circle it. We come up. 
2008, we make the ultimate high here. You guys don't have my pointer? Cynthia? I'm moving it around. Let me just double check. Okay. At least somebody has it. Okay. No, yes, good. We, we do see it, Tim. Okay, I'm just checking. <laughs> I I thought, oh, no, I stepped up again. Myself. Oh, no. Okay, here we go. So now we're at a major swing high in in, uh, in July. And uh, you know, let me take a breath here. That pointer thing it gets me every time. All right. We're at a major swing high in July. And uh, just circle it. It's no big deal here, folks. Take, and there's a reason to circle it. Just put it in here. We're doing something called myelination, okay? We're drilling it into your brain. We're, we're easing the path in your neurons. And that will be important later on. So we're going to circle this major high. Then as we come off, this is our first pullback. Take a look. Here's our run up. Here's our major high. Here's our first pullback. And we're going to circle this. And we've got one low and a second low. And you can see they're higher lows. That's all we need to know for now. Now, this is... Um, I'll let you decide if you can understand where this came from, but this is a tool that I developed. But it is a derivative of Dr. Andrews' work. And I call it the line of maximum excursion. And I find, when we, especially when we have a pullback that, that is this nice off of a major swing low, if we come off and then start to take out swing highs, and this would be a swing, a minor swing low, and then we take it out, that makes this a low right here. So here's our swing high. We pull back. When we take out that swing high, that makes this a low. When we start to make, take out swing highs and then leave higher lows again, that first pullback is extremely important, and so often it doesn't get violated. So I call that the line of maximum excursion. We can use that for a lot. I'll let you see if you can figure out the other way this line can be developed or how you can see this line. Don't type it in. First piece of homework for you. If you don't get it, that's okay. You can do what I did here, just draw in the line of maximum excursion. So I just connected what you would call a simple trend line from this major swing low to this first pullback swing low. And I project it out in time and space. Now, this line has a slope because it's not horizontal. I just copy this line. Now remember, I do this in general on hand charted paper. So when you're working with weekly data, you've got plenty of time to think and plenty of time to plan your lines. It's one of the beauties of hand charting. I'm going to copy this. You can certainly do this on computers. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it over to the major swing high. And you can see I slid it down a little bit to grab this secondary high. This is a little bit of fluff by the market. And it's weekly, so we have a lot of room for fluff. You can leave it at the high you want. It's not going to make much of a difference. No. I'm just going to bisect these lines, which means I took a ruler. I measured from here to here. I took the halfway point. And I projected that out of space at the same angle. And lo and behold, you can take a look and see. I like the way it touches here. I even like the way it catches this spike here. It's a little sloppy, but no more sloppier than this. Our next run up catches the top perfectly. And remember, this line, I didn't design it based on catching these tops. All I did was grab the first pullback and project it forward. And look how well the slope works all the way up here. That gives me lots of confidence in these lines. Boys and girls, please do me a favor. Pay attention to the presentation. Save your chat for later, okay? Because there's important information here. You can chat later amongst yourself or you can ask questions, okay? It's distracting to me and it's distracting everybody else. Thank you. So it's all based on this line right here. It's not based off of these times off these tops. However, take a look at how well it catches these tops. This tells you that this set of lines 
is working hard for you. There's no magic here. It's just a major swing low, major swing high, first pullback. Nothing more than that. Now, here's Dr. Andrews' median line. Same pivots, major swing low, major swing high, first pullback. They look familiar? All I do is, the computer. if you have a computer training package, of course, it's going to draw it perfectly. But all you would do is connect the second pivot, the B pivot, to the C pivot, the first pullback. Find the center. Take the center. Draw it backwards to the major low or the A pivot. And then project it on the space. That gives you your slope. Copy it off the C pivot. Copy it off the B pivot. You've got a median line. If you've got a, char a charting package, you just click on A, B, C. It gives you the median line. Almost all of them do that. Now, let's take a look. This is called a modified shift median line, which was invented by Jeremy Schiff and presented at Dr. Andrews' house in 1972. I was there. And his presentation, if you could turn this chart upside down, was actually about stocks that lost 80 to 90 percent of their value, and he wanted to know, if I use a traditional median line, it doesn't help me, so I'm looking for a method that tells me when to get long stocks. And he worked with Dr. Andrews and came up with something called a shift median line, which moves price, if we draw a line straight up, the A pivot would go, instead of down here, the beginning of our drawing would be 50% up. Dr. Andrews did some study after a while, and he came back and he said, you know, I think it should be a modified shift, and it should be up 50% and over 50%. And if you go, I try and make these so they play into one another. If you go back and look at the last two presentations that I did here, we spent a lot of time working on the shift, the modified shift median line. And there's some gems in there that play directly into this and the homework that you have if you want to do homework from this, from this session. So do yourself a favor and go back and pull it up. I'm not going to go over it in detail again. But this is a modified shift median line. And you can see, if you go back and look at the prior two presentations, it won't be a secret. If you haven't, you're going to have, have to discover why. Look at it catch the bottoms beautifully as well as the tops beautifully. And there's a reason for that. Go ahead and do your homework. Or just use the line of maximum excursion, copy it on top, bisect it. Now, just to give you a feel, pardon me, I had to have some green tea there. Just to give you a feel for the longer term, even longer term beans, and because there's a, and there's a reason. I did a traditional median line that went all the way back to 2002. And this is when prices were caught in what was then thought the traditional 30-year pattern of beans was basically, if you could buy them around $4.50 and sell them out, Seven fifty, maybe even at best eight bucks. That was the trading range for beans for thirty years. We'd have an occasional spike above, and every once in a while we'd yell beans in the teens, but we would seldom get there. We'd never be up in here. So let's go all the way back to the beginning, and, and we're we're bumping along at the very bottom of what would have been the range for thirty years, and we'll use that as our a a point. Now we have this one run up which gets rejected just before we get into the teens. And this is a width median line because it catches all of this garbage in here. We're just kind of bumping along the bottom, and then we finally take off. We we'll use that as our C point, which, if you remember, this was the A point in our in our uh, maximum excursion line right here. This was our major pivot low, major pivot high, first pullback. So let's take a look and see how that settles in. Major low, major high. This was the beginning of the maximum excursion line. A traditional median line, you can see, pretty much the same line. It projects this high, and again, median lines have a mathematical probability in them. So I'm not surprised, but many of you, if you've never seen median lines, or maybe if you get more and more exposed to median lines, you'll begin to see this and believe this. It does a great job of projecting forward the probable path of price, and it even catches this high all the way up at $18. It's pretty good for a projection that came from, let me just zoom my little eyes in here, middle of 2006, something that comes in three years later. And look at it grab the tops nicely. 
and looking to grab the bottoms. So it's doing a great job. This modified shift, of course, comes from this major low, this major high, and the first pullback. Our magic, max, excuse me, maximum excursion line would be from this major low, the first pullback, processed forward. So now you see a, a historical perspective. You don't need this, but if you need if you're a relative newcomer, you need the mathematical validity, or if you just need the visual validity, you can see that this set of lines pretty well nails it. All right? So both median lines point us to the correct slope, and that's what's important. That's what gives us the probable path to price. So when I draw, I must be aware of these key areas, and I have to choose the lines that interact with these areas. So I'll actually circle this area, circle this area, circle this congestion and say, okay, these are the areas that I need when I draw. Are they being caught? Does the median line play to these areas? Because if they don't, going forward, I'm going to be worried. And, of course, they do. It gives me more confidence. Either one of the median lines or the line of maximum excursion. So I draw with that in mind. You don't just draw blindly. Okay, so now we're going to, again, Please don't start with weeklies or daily or yearlies and then drill down to dailies. Instead, if you're going to trade dailies, just start on dailies, and you'll see why in a second. And again, we're holding questions, okay? So here's the daily chart. Same time period as our first weekly. These are continuous CBOT beans. Here's our traditional meeting line. This is the major low. This is the major high. Here's our first pullback. We're being consistent. We're using exactly the same pivots. Now you can see, if I'm trading over here, I could put a warning line, which is I could measure from here to here, flip it over with the same, but I'm not sure that's going to help me, and it didn't work here. It's not what I'm looking for. Remember when I talked about it needs to grab certain areas for me, and this median line is not doing what I need it to do. So what, what's a trader to do? Well, I can turn it into a modified shift. It's still using this low, this high, this first pullback. I'm going up 50%, over 50%. Now, I grab the bottoms nicely. I'm getting this area congestion nicely. I'm getting this high and this high just fine. It's doing what I want. I could also just put in the line of maximum excursion from here, first pullback, project it forward. Let's take a look now. We're going to go swing by swing. And we want to do that because we want to know, first of all, how the median line is interacting with price. And we can tell how it interacts swing by swing. what's likely to happen as price goes forward in time or space. So we go from this major high, this first pullback, to the next peak. We look at the median line. It's a downsloping median line. Dr. Andrew says price should make it to the median line 80% of the time. Let's take a look. We don't make it to the median line. The median line's here. So after the C point right here, we should come down and make it to the median line. We don't. What does that tell us? That tells us without even knowing about something esoteric called the Hagopian's rule, just by Dr. Andrews' simple explanation that price should make it to the median line 80% of the time, we know that price is likely to head higher. If price doesn't make it to the median line, that means it should make it farther in the opposite direction. But there's again, there's something we can do. We can use a modified shift. So we take the same median line, this high, this low, this high, and we use a modified shift, which means we take the A point down 50%, over 50%. Started here. Now take a look. We still don't make it to the median line. It tells us that price is headed higher, even using the modified shift. But there's another use for this. We take a look. And we say, okay, did price make it to the median line? No, it missed it by about this much. Okay. 
we measure that distance or you can just eyeball it and we're just going to put it on the other side and you can see this upper parallel or outside parallel right here missed the turn before we hit, skyrocketed higher by about this much so this median line has about this much slop in it and that's important we're going to use that in a little bit but because it's on both sides and they're relatively equidistant I like that this swing is described by the simple A B pardon me A B C that we use for these pivots so the pivots are unfolding and the mathematical relationship of median lines is holding together as the pivots unfold so let's see if that continues now we've got the next median line, which happens to be an upsloper. First pullback, next high, next major low. What do we get? Hey, not bad. So price and time are coming together pretty good with this median line. And because this is so many days, look, this is, oh my God, June until, mm, let's give it December. June to December, it's lots of days. I'm going to give that that it touched both the magenta upsloping median line and the green median line. We call this an energy point. It attracts price. And, yeah, it missed it by a tick or two, but it's pretty close. I'm going to give it that it touched this. So, once again, this median line off of just this low, high, low, which is the next set of pivots, did its job. Price made the median line, and in this case, it rejected it and it turned lower. Price makes it to the median line 80% of the time, and sure enough. Let's look at the next one. This is a downsloper. High, low, high. Jury's still out. We haven't traded through it. We're still on our way down in this one. So let's keep this one in mind. In fact, I'm even going to draw a smaller one. I'm going to go from one of the inside swings. This poke high, let me go back and show you. See this poke? I'm going to use that for my A pivot. First pull back on that major high, inside high. And then I'm going to take it to the highest high. And I'm going to use that as a down sloper. It doesn't bother me to trade it out of it a little bit because I can put a warning line on it. You can see pretty well grabs it up here. Where does this project? We're back inside of it. Now it's it's called re-entering the median line. We're back inside of it. We seem to be heading lower at this point. We had an, this is our controlling sweep in an outside swing, higher high, higher low. Where are we headed? I put it all together. I've got this black median line that hasn't been met yet. I've got the lower parallel. Look how many times it's been tested. And I've got the red median line. Here's the C pivot. We've been tested right after it started, but now that we've re-entered it, I expect it to come back and test the median line, all coming together in the same place. This is the area I'm going to focus on. I'm going to take a look at the biologics that we talked in the beginning as I hone this in, and I'm going to take a look at literally price and time. It's going to give me a target. And it, you know, it sounds like it's almost too perfect, but if you relax and trust the lines, and hopefully I gave you enough information that when you go back and review the slides, you can draw them out yourself. There's no magic here. This is not math magic. This is not somebody's uh, uh, crazy presentation where you scratch your head and say, okay, that's fascinating, but how would I do that? You can do this off the major pivots. It's pretty easy to do. And when you uh, move back in, t in time frame and you use weeklies or dailies, you don't have a lot of pivots and just use the ma major pivots, you'll see this geometry unfold a lot. So we're going we're gonna to funnel in or hone in, focus in right here. I know this is cluttered. I'll clean it up in a second. This is a working chart, and then I've just labeled it. But take a look. This is, remember, this is our inside one with the, this nice little poke higher. First pullback, major high, 
projected forward. This is our, take a look at this blue one. We're going to talk about this in a second, this really heavy, dark blue one. Keep that in the back of your mind. We'll talk about it in a second. Then we have our downsloping black median line. It hasn't made it to the median line. The red and black, and then the lower parallel of the big modified shift that's been tested and tested and tested over here to the left. They all come together right here. So I'm going to do, I don't know if this is magic, I'm going to do a parlor trick for you. Now, I do this on my charts all the time. All the time. But I don't show this very often. I'm doing this as a thank you to all of you, including Barbara and Cynthia, for being willing to hold off for three weeks because I had to postpone. This is a median line that I've drawn. Let's take a look. It's October, and I'm projecting this median line forward in space about two months. And I'm doing it because I can come to the C pivot with a good reliability, in my opinion, because I know that price is likely to hit the black median line. I know that price is likely to come and touch the lower parallel. Dr. Andrews tells us with 80% probability, price is going to go to its next most likely line or the median line. In this case, it's the lower pink parallel of this modified shift. It's also the median line of this black downsloping median line set. And it's also the median line of this red minor median line set. And they all come together right here. So I can go to the last low, the last major low right here before we head it higher. And I can use that for my A point of my, let's call it an imaginary median line. I can use that for my A point. My B point's easy. I just use the highest high. Then I'm going to stretch it out. And I'm just going to anchor it where they all come together. So in a certain sense, there's no discretion here. I expect price to come into this area. So I'm going to use a median line that doesn't exist yet. It can't exist. Price isn't here yet. But I'm going to imagine that it's here. That's why it's in thick, heavy blue lines. And I hope you all can follow it. Again, I do this all the time, especially when I portfolio trade. Now, I took everything else off. It's like you clear the chessboard whoosh, so you can see clear. Everything else was a distraction. I left in the pink modified shift line because it had been tested so many times. We know also that this is the line of maximum excursion, and it also is the lower parallel of the traditional median line that goes all the way back to 2002. It's been tested, 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 tested. As long as it's been tested and working, why not believe in it again? We also know that all three of these median lines came together right here, so I drew in the imaginary median line from this low, which started the run-up, this major high, and I projected it right where they all come together, right here. And now I'm going to mark this. I'm going to call this a time capsule. I'm going to mark this a little timing event right here. It says, hey, if it was perfect, it would be right here, let's say that's the, oh, it's right at Christmas time of December. So there's going to be a gift for me under the tree at Christmas time. And throughout the stalking process, I'm going to keep this timing mechanism right on my charts as the charts update. And that's the time and price window of opportunity. That's when time and price come together, okay? Let's take a look. We're going to zoom in even closer. And you can see now, I'm giving it a plus or minus of about a month. So maybe the 9th of December, I don't know what it is in January, it's about the 14th, 15th of January, something like that. And here's my center date, it's right where my imaginary median line, which is where all the actual median lines came together on this lower parallel. This is our timing event right here, time and price window of opportunity. And I expect price will fall somewhere in this window. Sometimes it's a tiny bit early. Sometimes it's a tiny bit late. But I can work with this. Okay, price is coming down. And you can see I left the time and price window of opportunity. It's right there at the crook or the corner of this median line. Price is coming down. 
That's all right. I'm waiting. I have nothing to do yet. I want to see price trade. But this is where I expect it to come home and do its business. Let me put it all back in again so we can review it. This will be our maximum excursion line from this low to the first pullback projected forward. The modified shift comes from this low, this high, this low, up 50%, over 50%. Instead of having the beginning of the tail down here, it's up 50%, over 50%. Our black meeting line started from this high, this major pullback low, which started this high, at this high, here's our A, B, C projected forward. And then we have a smaller inside median line, one run up. We've got a spike here, push lower. We grab the spike, the push lower, then the ultimate high. They all come together in one spot. And that is going to be the C point of my imaginary median line. And now you can see it. It's off of this low, this high, and a C point that hasn't happened yet. We're still about a month or two in advance. It's all come together now. You can take a look at this. When you get the slides, if you're lost, this is how I put together this imaginary media line. Here's my time and price window of opportunity. It says, hey, if grains are going to bottom, and if you're going to get in there and catch it, Tim, it's going to be somewhere between this date and this date right here, and here's why. And I keep that in front of me. Price comes down. We're getting closer and closer and closer to our window opportunity. And here's our calendar dates. Now I've taken off the other line to just make it easy to see. I just want it to be crystal clear for all of you. And you have to be as patient as possible. You don't want to trade here. You'll get stopped out. You don't want to trade here. It's not time yet. When is it time? It's when you're within the window of opportunity and when price is doing something interesting. Right now, we're still plunging, and we're not even in the window of opportunity. We're also not at the lower parallel. So there's nothing to do right now other than wait. It's basically Thanksgiving. Let's go in even closer. Push your, your chairs back around three feet so you get a nice, clear view of the chart. We are now in the window of opportunity. Now take a look. As we came down, I told you it wasn't time to trade. As we're plunging, look at it. We've got an outside bar. That means it's got a higher high than the prior bar and a lower low than the prior bar and it closes on its low that's the importance there are still sellers in this market and look at the next bar we continue to sell off and we close on our low so it's a new low and it closes on its low I understand that it did rally but we haven't even gotten near this upsloping lower parallel it's too early to trade more people lose money trading by trading early just slow down just relax and wait for the market to be where it's supposed to be when it's supposed to be and to do what it's supposed to do before you trade price comes up starts to sell off again and look we are now in the window of opportunity so we're paying attention and take a look we come down and we make a new low close on our lows. Now we make a new low, but we close on our highs. That's the difference between this area and this area. Does it mean it's going to bottom? No, but we have a couple things going for us. We're testing a line that's been tested, I don't know, five, six, seven times and major lows were put in against it and never been taken out. We are also in an area where four median lines have come together, plus or minus a few days. And these are called areas of confluence or an energy point. They act as an attractor, and they also act as an area where if price is going to turn, 
it will turn. And again, it it's not going to be to the day because we're talking about a chart that started this median line started in 2006. We're looking in 2011. It's a five-year median line even on the dailies. So if we're off by five or ten days, that's it's that's incredibly accurate. So we pay attention to price action to tell us what's going on. But we need to be in the window of opportunity and we need to see price action down at the lower parallel, which we're seeing, and we need to see some buyers. At this point, we do need to think about trading. One thing that's important about grains, remember to most people it seems awful early to be thinking about a bottom in December, but once it turns you will have a difficult time getting onto this trend, on any trend in the, mar in the grains. The beauty of the grains are if you catch them, they run and run and run. The bad part is if you can't look for the turns and don't have a good way to look for the turns, which I'm giving you today, you will miss the turns and you will have a difficult time making money in the grains. Because if you chase price in the grains, you will be getting in at extremes, which most people do, and you will be getting stopped out over and over, which most people do. So you have to enter at the appropriate times with the appropriate methodology, using good stops, and stick with your plan because you're only going to get a shot or two each season. So, again, go back and take a look at exactly what happened here. New low closes on low, new low closes on high, and it's within our window of opportunity as well as at our lower parallel that's been tested and spawned five or six major run ups in the past five or six years. Again, Let's take a look. Look at it call a turn. Look at it come down and test, and it's a major bottom. Test again, two major bottoms. Runs up, major high. Price stuck here and here and here, and price respected this median line here and here. Why wouldn't you expect this set of lines to work now? Why would you bet against this line now? makes no sense. This line is working perfectly. I'm willing to trade against it. So when we come down and get to this lower parallel, which is, well, pay attention, when you see the pink line in this next line, the magenta line in this next slide, it's this line right here. We're coming in right where we should, where all the median lines met, on this pink line right here in early December. Now take a look at it up close. We're coming into this line right here. And here we had a new low, closes on the low, but we weren't in the window of opportunity and we weren't at the lower parallel. Now we're within a tick or two of the lower parallel. We make a new low, price closes on its high. We're within the window of opportunity. I'm willing to get ready to trade here now. So I've got an order in. I'm going to buy a retest of the two bar low. So I'm going to take a look at this formation and say, if it gets at this low, I'm willing to get long. Let's talk a little bit about stops. We have to take a look, if we're going to trade daily grain charts, we have to take a look at bars like this, bars like this, bars like this, bars like this. Uh, Bars like this. Here's bookends, as my partner Shane would say. Bars like that. You can't use a 10-point stop in the grains unless you have structure because you're going to get wide-range bars. This particular bar is 73 points from the top to the bottom. And many daily bars on this chart are between 50 and 75 points from the top to bottom. It, currently, when grains are above 10 cents and they're as we're looking at this, they're at 11 cents. The limit is 75 cents. Seems like a lot of dough, and it is. You have a couple choices. If your account's not big enough, your first choice could be not trade the grains. Nothing wrong with that. Second possibility would be trade the mini contracts. 
for portfolio trading, they work just fine. Again, save your questions for later, please. Third possibility, you could use ETFs. There are several grain ETFs. We trade. We go over them all the time and show trades, live trades with them at Market Geometry all the time. It's like trading stocks. Do the formations exactly mirror soybeans? No, but they have their own formations, and they catch the turns just fine, and they catch the tops just fine. Nothing wrong with trading ETFs. Nothing wrong with trading options. You can come with your strategy based off charting. You can't afford a futures. You can trade an option. You can buy a long base call. You can do a call spread. There's lots of things you can do. But one thing you should never do, first of all, is trade without a stop. That's the best way for you to lose all the money in your account. And I guarantee you, Barbara and Cynthia would tell you, as I do, please don't trade that way. Secondly, don't be cheap on your stop. If your stop is, for example, underneath this gap or underneath this formation, and you go, you know, I don't really think I can afford it. Let me just put it halfway. You might as well just write the check. That's no protection at all. Use the correct stop. If you can't afford it, don't take the trade. Or trade using different instruments. Express your risk using a different instrument, whether it's an option, a mini, or even an ETF. But by all means, do not try to use a cheaper stop just because you can't afford it. You've just cheated yourself. Please don't do that. So I get low. I get long. Here you can see there's our little dance here where we closed on our high. We made a new low, closed on our high. Next day we went higher. I've got my order in already. Two days later, we come down. We actually make a slightly lower low, and I get filled. And if you remember, it was about the 6th or 7th from December all the way to somewhere in here was our window of opportunity. I'm long in the grains. And now look what happens. I get long this day. You, if you were paying attention and didn't have an order in, you might have had an okay entry here. But look what happens if you don't have your entry in. The train leaves the station pretty darn fast. And this is typical of the grains. If you're not there when they turn, ready to trade, they get out of reach pretty fast. So you have to do your work in advance. You have to be ready to trade. You have to have correct stops. There's lots of things that you need to do. Make a plan and follow your plan. And remember, we're going to do a week trade as well, so you get another opportunity to see what unfold. So I'm long. Here's my imaginary median line. You can see how I did. Not too bad. I'm off by about, I don't know. Let's, let's walk back. I'm off by about, uh, I get long on about the 15th. No. Yes, about the 15th of December. And my bottom was around the 27th. So I'm off by about 12 days, which considering this median line was based off of a six-year chart, not too bad. Here's the big picture. If I risked 55 points, well, that was my stop loss, my potential profit from here to my profit target at 1448 and a half is 346 points. My risk reward then will be 6.3. Those of you that are at market geometry or that have been to several of the IB sessions know I don't trade below 3 to 1. In other words, for every dollar I risk, I expect to get paid at least $3. That comes from Amos's work. I'm long at 11 double and a half, and I'm looking for 14.48 and a half. So I risked 55 points, and you can see, that if you didn't catch it in the first few days, I mean, you'd be trading all the way up at 11.50, 11.60 if you were willing to do that, and your stop wasn't any better. Now, if you had a reason to get long here, you're, you could have gotten long in this area, but your stop would have been about the same. So any way you look at it, you have to have the correct stop. 
And as I said, getting in at the correct time is extremely important. You'll see that in, in, in wheat in a second. I always measure my risk reward perceived, meaning at the beginning, and my risk reward realized, meaning how much I took out of this trade at the end. And in this case, they worked out to be exactly the same, meaning I didn't even move my profit target. I was basing my profit target not off of going to the median line, but in this case, just making prior highs because I had this high and I had a secondary high, and they were almost the same. So I wanted out as we got close to that level. So I took my 346 points. You do the math at 50 cents a point. It's lots of money. This is a wonderful trade. It's one reason why I'm so happy about this summer. But this is just the beginning of the fun. Now look, I drew this months before the C pivot even formed. Okay? Remember, I drew this two and a half months before price even got down here to form the C pivot. And it projected price and time forward. And look at, this is where I took my profit. Take a look at how it respected, how the soybeans respected this median line that I drew months in advance. Perfect. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't ask for anything nicer than this. I'm in. Price weren't where I wanted to go. I am out. Do I expect all my median lines, that I, especially these imaginary median lines, to perform this well? No, of course not. But I expect them to be useful. I expect them to give me the probable path of price. If you do your homework, go over what I showed you here in practice, this is not unreachable for any of you. It really isn't. We teach this at Market Geometry all day long. All day long. All Any kind of market, any time frame, we see it over and over and over again. We're going to do something different in the wheat, but it's a similar idea, and hopefully you'll be able to catch on. Here's some homework. Ding, 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 ding. And it's advanced homework. I'm not going easy on anybody today because I'm showing you some very advanced concepts. I'm going to give a blatant plug for another member of Dr. Andrews' inside group. He says, uh, I just never get tired of all the beauty. Never get tired, Tim. I uh, wish Dr. Andrews was here. Thank you very much, uh, OC. I appreciate it. All right, so here's some advanced homework. OC doesn't have to work at it. We're going to do it. Everybody else has to. Now, I got out at these prior highs when we tested these prior highs right here. And Barbara knows this. I've done, oh, I don't know, at least five years, uh, maybe, maybe eight years of grain presentations with her. Some of them live. Uh, we post them at the Board of Trade and people could watch them with Watch the Orders Change Weekly. And one of the things that, one of the rules that I always use serves me well is the moment we get our first tropical depression, if I'm long grains, I liquidate my grain positions. And we had a very odd, very early tropical depression this year. You can go back and take a look. And my wife, here's how I get the news, and I, those of you that are at market geometry know this. I don't watch the news. I don't read the newspapers. I do read The Economist, but short of that, that's about the only news I get, other than what my children tell me or my wife. So at 5.30 in the morning, I get up. My wife's having her coffee. I walk by the desk. I hey, say, anything going on, darling? And she always gives me three tidbits of news. And I walked by her desk one day, and she said, uh, and I was long a bunch of grains. I just loaded up with grains. Yeah, I think there's a tropical depression. I said, no, it's April. It can't be. Well, I've got it right here. It's in the Tribune. Of course, I live in Arizona, boys and girls, in the mountains. Uh, the Tribune is the Chicago newspaper. Uh, Tommy Skilling has his, his uh, the weatherman, great weather, green weatherman, has his uh, forecast there as well as on WGN. And so it really affects the grain markets. I said, are you sure? She said, she pulled it up for me, and I read it. And I thought, oh, son of a gun. So I did a double check, and sure enough, they were calling whatever. I don't remember what the it, the A letter is. They do them, you know, alphabetically. First the tropical depression very early this year. I just liquidated. Now, and, and it was also in my area as well. We're right up in these areas. I got the price I wanted, dumped out all my grains. Price went a little bit higher, and, of course, pulled back. Now we have nothing going on. There's no tropical depressions, no nothing. It's just everybody's talking about the grain markets. There's, oh, they're flood. the grain markets are going to have a record year. Everybody was sure that the market was going to be wonderful, that the that the, the yield would be huge, the 
crop conditions were absolutely magnificent when they were going to plant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm out. Grains are selling off. Use the methodology that I did on both the weeklies and the dailies, either maximum excursion lines, you can use modified shifts, you can use traditional median lines, you can even use what I'm about to show you in the wheat, and see if you can find why I was willing to go long in the grains here. I was willing to get long again in the soybeans in June and caught the bottom on the day, to the day. We had a runaway gap underneath. You can use take a look at that for stops as a hint. And see if you can pinpoint why I would have gotten along here. It's advanced. A lot of you may not get it. But if you want some homework, this is gorgeous. Because I'll tell you what, not only did I ride this higher, I got rid of half, not only for myself, but I have four clients, all sovereign wealth funds. Got them long as well. Took them out, took half of my profit. I'm sitting still long, and grains are at their highs or making highs. Again, don't make a guess now, boys and girls. No, 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 don't make a guess. Do your homework. Okay? You can email me, timothymorge at gmail.com, timothymorge at marketgeometry.com. And uh, I don't know, we'll talk to Barbara. Maybe we can do a, uh, a little homework review in one of the sessions coming up and give away something. But. Uh, Go ahead and do some detailed homework. If nothing else, it'll do your soul good. So let's see what we get. Anyway, I nailed this. I'm still long half. Took off half up in here. Still long half. And by the way, the same method also gave me the projection to take off half. See if you can figure that out. If you want some advanced homework. And let me just give you another slice. In June, I also hunted and caught this low in the beans. Actually, I think this should be here. This is where I got along. Sorry, should be here. Pardon me. This low here. When you do your homework, pardon my bad circle. My circle should be right here. How did I find it? I got out at these prior highs. How did I catch this pullback? Let me show you. That's weekly. Let me show you on the daily. I guess not. That's the daily. Here's the weekly. The weekly's marked wrong. How did I catch this low? Okay, that's your homework. You would have thought with the three weeks off, it would have caught the mistake, but I didn't. My apologies. All right. Now, this is the fun part. I, will, I wasn't going to do this in the original presentation, but I know OC is looking at his jobs because most people have never seen this stuff, and, and uh, only, only uh, even the Dr. Andrews do. We don't throw this stuff around very often amongst ourselves. So anyway, let's go. Thank you, my friend. Hopefully, you can be there, my friend. Oh, he's even, you know, oh, see, I love it. He's even giving props to my kids. I appreciate it. Okay. It's always nice to see you, brother. Okay, so let's take a look at wheat. This is uh, daily CBOT wheat. And this is my working wheat chart. And this is how it looked in early spring. Okay? So I'm already long beans. Actually, uh, now that I look at it, I'm outish of my beans. I've done nothing in the wheat. Now, remember, wheat's a funny animal. There are two wheat crops. There's winter wheat and spring wheat, summer wheat. And they mature at different times. So, actually, when beans and corn are going crazy, wheat's just waking up. It's already been planted in the prior fall. It's waking up. And there's really not much going on. Most people have turned their attention. Um, if you will, prices get active when people pay attention to what's going on in their crop. Now, I know the president has had bad things to say about speculators. That's okay. I'm a proud speculator. I've been speculating and making my living speculating for over 40 years. I'm proud to say that we have a place in the economy. You know, we're we're the liquidity providers. We're the reason why people, farmers can lay off their risk while the head while the people that have grain um, silos can lay off their risk. Why Archer Daniel Mindel can lay off their their risk. So nothing wrong with speculating. But speculators are not paying attention to wheat at this point. There's nothing going on. If there's nothing going on, we have other things to do. But there does come a time to pay attention to wheat. So I keep my charts updated at all at all times. So we're looking at wheat. 
I'm, up, I'm out of my grains or I'm about out of my wheat or out of my uh, beans. First tropical depressions here or about to show up. This is what my working chart looks like. And what do I have? Somebody mentioned here a uh, multi-pivot line. Yeah, I've got a multi-pivot line, so I'm grabbing tops and bottoms. And you can see in this run up, there's really no pullback, but there's a little kind of a dough -si dough right here. I'm drawing right through that. And I've got tops and bottoms right in here. And I'm just projecting that forward. And then on top of that, this is basically very range-ish. Yes, we made a spike higher, and if you just double the range, of course, we're at the high of the spike. But this is the meat of the action right here. It's just, Tim, pay attention. Wheat is rangy, and here's the range. Okay, this is what my working chart's for. It gives me clues so that when I update a chart or when I take a look at wheat, I have visual clues so I know exactly what's going on. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to do anything. Maybe I have to draw in one bar. But by having this box here, it says to me, hey, buddy, if you're in the middle of this box, ain't much going on. You don't have to think about it. Okay? That's how I keep my charts. Now, I'm out of my beans. I'm out of my corn. I'm relaxed. I don't even remember if I'm still in my oil trade. But for some reason, wheat started to catch my eye. Now, charts are all about frequency. In fact, what we teach at Market Geometry, we actually teach Newtonian physics. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If you want to go back to the Sumerians, five, six, seven thousand years ago, as above, so below. In fact, that's where Sir Isaac Newton got the concept for his three laws of motion. It's all about frequency, which is a measure of energy and the motion of energy. And price oscillates around this perceived motion. So I start out by one day just taking a look and seeing some frequency in the chart. Now, I'm not going to draw it all the way across yet, but this is the line that I drew in first. And I didn't draw I'm literally, these are recreations of my hand-drawn charts through time, as they're paged through time. And I keep records. First, I drew this line segment right here. Now, again, remember, I'm doing this hand-drawn, so I don't have messy lines over the chart, because if you erase one section, you have to recreate all the bars as well. But I just take a look, and you should be able to see this. If I take this slope and run it here, it's the same slope. If I take this slope and run it here, it's the same slope. This slope goes through here, catches tops and bottoms here. This slope runs throughout this chart. But this is the first place my eye caught it. Now, I'm pretty good at this, but it's not terribly hard. The hard part is knowing what to do with it after you learn how to draw it. Once you draw a few of these, it's not that hard to find lines that describe price, which is what we're doing. Okay? Let's see what my next creation was in wheat. Well, I have this line. I might as well have what I call as a line of opposing force. So I've got a downsloping line. Now I've got an upsloping line. And look at this line, and just imagine in your eyes. You can see it here. You can see it this bottom and this top. You can see it here to here to here, all the way in here. This line catches my eye as well. But this is where I first saw it. This extreme low, this major pullback. This is we our first pullback. See it? And as we come through it, we're bouncing against it. See it? Bounce against it, bounce against it, bounce against it. This line caught my eyes. This line tells me a lot about this market. What am I going to do with it? Okay, a couple more days go on. I come back to the wheat chart. 
I'm in no hurry. There's nothing going on. I'm in the middle of the box. But I add a downsloping line, and I add it very faintly, because I don't know that I need it. I'm just doodling at this point. I want to be able to erase it easily. And I add it off of this extreme. Same slope as this line. Now I take another one off of this extreme. Same slope as here. And I use something called a rolling protractor to draw this. Add it up in here. Now notice these are not equidistant, meaning the distance from here to here is not the same as here to here. It doesn't have to be. I don't care. I'm just looking at price extremes. And I want to know, does this slope or the way price burns energy or the way energy oscillates it's like a sine wave that's sloped. Does it work? And yes, it does in many ways. I draw that in there and take a look. Yikes, you guys are probably, your eyes are probably all going to explode now, but bear with me here. And again, these are not equal distant. Just take a moment and stare at this. I'm going to have a drink of tea. You take a look at this. Inspect all the places. I'll highlight a couple of them. You go ahead and inspect all the places where price interacts with these lines. Just take your time. I don't have this one drawn in, but look at them down here. Now I have what I call diamonds. Not Jamie Diamond. Diamonds. And I, it's a proprietary. I don't teach it very often. I don't even show it very often. It's a study in how energy moves from a downsloping line to an upsloping line. And you can use this when you trade. And I'll give you a glimpse into this world. What am I going to do with it? Here's how I formed it. I grab this line first. Then I found a bisect here. I measured the distance, flipped it over. Measured the distance, flipped it over. Take a look how it works. Works pretty good. Does it give me exact highs and lows? Not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for frequency. Now, I've got all my diamonds going. I take a look and I say, hey, this area has price and time coming together. And you can see the frequencies of both the sloping lines, upward and downward, how they carry throughout this chart. I love this area. I just love it. Now, it may take you a while. In fact, many of you will never get to the point where you, where you will trust or draw action reaction lines. These are action reaction lines. These are not median lines. And this is my own proprietary version, which is I always like to have upsloping and downsloping, opposing lines of force, and I like to look at how they interact. And I can tell how they interact, where they're likely to hone in, and they're likely to hone in. This is an area, it's a magnet. I have not only the lattice or the diamond work, but I've got this beautiful multi-pivot line, and the low end of the range, all coming together in one area. I would love to trade there if I have a stop, and if I think price is going to get there. So let's use some of the same techniques that we did in the soybeans. Here's our time and price window of opportunity. A little bit on one side, a little bit on the other. How do I get there? I take a look at how, uh, how far away price hits from the diamonds on average in a chart like this. That tells me how wide the window of opportunity has to be. If price gets there, I want to buy. In fact, here's what my orders would look like. Ready? I want to buy wheat at 595 and a half. My initial stop is going to be below. Look, I've got one drive lower, second drive lower, third drive lower. I'm going to go underneath the lowest low, it's 572.5. I'm going to go just five 
cents below that. So my, my stop's going to be at 567 and a half. I'm going to buy at 595 and a half. This is a very affordable stop in the grains, by the way. Initial risk, 28 points. Potential profit, 290 points. Yahoo. Risk reward, look at this. A sterling, 10.4. If you can line these trades up and price gets there, and you're right, you could just get stopped out, by the way, and you're right, it's absolutely wonderful. And boy, this can make for a great grain season for you. So take a look at this. This is what a diamond setup would look like. It's using the same physics principles as the line of maximum excursion, as well as media lines, but we're actually using raw physics. We're just looking at the frequency of price to show us where energy is likely to run out of downside direction and upside direction. So I want to buy wheat at 5.95 and a half. Let's see how this plays out. Well, I'm going to have to tell you the truth. This played out to the exact day, and I believe the low in the wheat was something like 593. It hit my diamond to the exact day. I did not take this trade. I did not take this trade. Let me just tell you, as I admit this, I, my stomach is fluttering. I am... I'm not embarrassed. I'm ashamed. I did not. I did all this work. I stalked this trade for months and months and months, and I did not. What's wrong with you exactly? I did not take this trade. But you know what? This should be a bit of a, a blessing to all of you. Hey, even a professional that trades, I, I trade tens of thousands of contracts at a time, make mistakes. And this is a sin. This is not a mistake. Because my motto is master your tools, master yourself. I was not in tune with my own work. I was not mastering myself, which is the biggest way for you to lose money. This is just the truth. I'm sorry. And it always helps to tell the truth. I did not take this trade. I did not believe in my own work. Please, if you do your work, if you have a plan, stick with your plan. Look at wheat take off. I had one day to enter. Look at this rascal take off. I, I'm telling you, oh my God. Yeah, he says, <laughs> Levy says, it's okay, but don't do it again. Well, let me just show you something. What was the concern from buying you there? You know you know what, Andre? And I'm, I'm, I said I wasn't going to look at questions, but let me just take these real quick because this is important. This is a moral question. Um, I don't know. I was distracted from something. Um, I, I really, you know what? I have to go back and look at my diary. I do keep a diary about all my trades, and, and uh, I didn't think that actually I should have quoted my diary, but uh, something distracted me that day. I didn't feel right, and uh, I'll tell you what, the next day when I came in to look at it, this is where I, I went, oh, my, what was I thinking? Yeah, it really is bad. Yeah, and the risk is really low for me, so this was really painful. Now, I used to trade with a woman... Actually, she still works for the CME, so I'm not going to say her name. And I, I used to laugh with her, not at her. She used to say, you know, if you're wrong, God will let you back in. All you have to do is admit you're wrong. And that would have been 1980. How about that? All the way back in 1980. Uh, she's still going strong, so, so am I. I'm watching this, and my heart is in my mouth. I just, oh, my God. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly right. Uh, I did not trade this, chase this trade, and that's extremely important. If you wake up on this day, don't jump into the market. You have to reset, first of all, mentally and emotionally, because really, a couple of days later, I'm pretty crippled at that point. I'm, I have no trades on at that point. I, I took a break for a few days in trading because I was just so emotionally cr crippled. But you got to stop. you got to clear your head. You got to let the market do its thing, and take a fresh look. So that's a good observation. Thank you very much. You see it take off. Hmm. 
Now what? We went all the way up to our upper diamond. Yeah, somebody said everybody got long, and I didn't, and that's all the people I taught. Probably, and, and God bless them if they want. That's fine with me. I don't. That's fine. That's good. We got all the way up to the upper diamond. You could have been taking your profit here, sitting back. Nothing wrong with this nice profit. Wheat comes all screaming all the way back. This is everybody talking about how wonderful the crops are going to be. There's not going to be any problem this summer, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't pay attention to any of that. I'm just doing this post-mortem. I went back and said, why did this pull back the way it did? Uh, everybody's talking about you know, there's going to be a bumper crop in every crop, and there's, the weather's going to be magnificent. There's not going to be any tornadoes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, they were right about the tornadoes, but they weren't really right about any of the other weather. When price comes down here, I still have my diamonds. I'm still updating my chart every day. And I see it crest, and I see it start to pull back. And I, yeah, my, at first I have the bobblehead going. Not really sure. Yes, this is a whale trade down here, and sometimes this does turn the market. It wasn't if it if it was a whale, it certainly wasn't me. It should have been me, but it wasn't. But you can see there wasn't much. All right, we turn and we head back lower. As we get down here, are you willing to get long wheat at 609 and a half instead of what the heck was our entry before? I'm sorry, at, instead of 595 and a half, so about 13 cents difference. You're still going to have to use the same stop. Remember that. And it's not at the energy point. It's now working its way up the diamond. I'll wait for you guys to answer. Anybody want to get long? Or has this already popped its cork and it's over? I got to know. I got to know. I got a yes? Okay. Okay, we get, we, just a little bit, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So now you get to play along on this one. Let's let's take a look. Those of you who want to find, those of you who don't, you got to venture to the interest of the craters. Let's see what happens. Let's see if Tim's willing to play. I want to buy wheat at six oh nine and a half. Why can't I put my stop here? Oh, by the way, I, I'm willing to bet. I'll take this trade if the market gives me a chance. Damn right, every time. I wish I had paid attention to my work here and believed in it, and I did not. And shame on me. But I'm willing to buy wheat at 609.5. Now, why can't I put my stop at 587.5 or underneath here? I could. It's in the noise, yeah. It's too close to the market. The real stop's still here. And look, if you did this, I've seen some pretty horrific stops. This isn't the worst stop in the world, but I'd at least be underneath here. I'd really like it underneath here. And this is well within my stop. So my initial stop loss will still have to be 567 and a half. Yeah, a lot of people are going to try and get long somewhere in here. And this is going to be the, everybody's going to have their stops here and they might get run. David says, is my risk reward too small? Let's take a look. Good question, David. Amos would be proud of you. And by the way, I'm the last trader left that uh, learned that was mentored by Amos Hostetter. Um, okay. I'm looking at the diamonds, okay? I expect this high to get taken out. I expect this high to get taken out, or I wouldn't get long. I'm going to get it long at 609.5. My initial stop is going to be at 567.5. Remember, my initial risk reward was 10 point something. Now, because I double clutched or waited, my stop went from 27 or 28 up to 42 cents. But my potential profit is still 276. My risk reward is 6.6. .6. So it's it's fine, David. It's not 10, but it's well above three. It's a very nice trade. It's just the size of the stop is up by about 14. That's the price for waiting. Let's see. Now, now that everybody sees the risk reward, now everybody sees the size of the stop. You still willing to get long? Anybody want to back out? Okay. Let me just tell you. 
it was a one-day poke again. A one-day poke. Price came down. I measured where price would hit the sliding lower part of the diamond. And we didn't even get the slot that we got in mid-May. It came down. It had one day lower. The next day was a wide range bar with a higher close, and it was gone. Just plain gone. Hi, Summer. Summer says, and she, Summer's from Market Geometry, if you'd gotten the original entry, you're still in the trade, right? Absolutely. And boy, it would have been a wild ride. In a certain sense, I didn't have to sit through this pullback. No, no doubt about it. And that would have been irpy is the technical term that we use. Um, but if you're portfolio trading, you get one or two chances per season. And so, unfortunately, this is one of the possibilities. I didn't have to sit through that. I wouldn't have got stopped out. But, yeah, maybe it happened for a reason. Could be. Could be. So price pulls back. One time poke down right to the line. How did I do this? I just work a, pr a, a limit order, a limit buy order, right at the line. That's all. What's my take on scalping? Not in the greens. We'll talk about it afterwards. Now, Robert, you, that's an interesting comment. Ask me if you, or tell me uh, after the session whether or not you want me to share that. If you don't want me to share it, I won't. All right, so now we break above this poke higher. You can see we, we blasted higher, ran out of energy, fell back to earth. This is our first pullback, if you will. You could even draw on a maximum excursion line off of this low and this first full pullback. This is where I got long on the first pullback. My partner Shane, this is his favorite place to trade, by the way, the first pullback, and, and I'm with him. And this was, this was not a bad stop. I'd much rather have my stop over here. In this case, it worked, but in a lot, of, a lot of times it does not work. You'll get shagged up because a lot of people will have stops down here and they'll run the stops. And 40, you know, this is only about 20 cents. 20 cents in the grain, if they know there are a lot of stops in there, they'll try and run them. In, in this case, the weather didn't give them any chance to go and we call it wash and rinse and go out there hunting for stops. No opportunity at all. When it turned around, it just skyrocketed. And when price breaks above the swing high, we're breaking into that upper diamond. Let me let me go back. Here's the diamonds. And you can see we're breaking into upper diamonds. Now we're breaking into lower diamonds. That's what we want to chart and pay attention to. And we're we're looking for diamonds up in here. Where this one meets another one up in here. Okay. So here we take off. Price is in the upper diamond now. And we're looking for it to get all the way to eight eighty five and a half. And of course, no worries. Look look where it I mean it just keeps right on running. In fact, today we're we're just about to break ten. Ten. I don't think we've ever been above ten on the green in the wheat, so Move my stop? Uh, sure. Um, let me go back. Yeah, I mean, at this point, if you look at the way this thing rocked, I like to use market structure. This would be market structure. This would be market structure. This whole set of formations is market structure. There's no market structure here at all until we gap right here and leave this consolidation it's very difficult to move your stop as a large speculator because we're going in one way it's it's one one straight up just take a look at it uh, my first opportunity is when we leave this consolidation and finally close and break above you can move your stop up here if you want to you can put profit floors in to, to preserve some some uh, profit if you want especially if you've taken a partial profit here um, and you certainly should have a stop on the balance here, for example. But you can see wheat was a rocket, just a rocket, right? It was just wonderful to be long. And you're out in the middle of July. Long as you're not in July. Thank you. Done. Now, food for thought. I'm known as a whale, not because I'm fat, but because I'm an extremely large trader or speculator in the markets that I trade. It's become a popular term. I, I've been talking about it uh, publicly in writing since 1995. Now you have start to hear people on CNBC. I don't listen to these people, but people send me clips and stuff. CNBC is talking about it, Fox News, all these other people. Uh, it's, you, know, you start to hear people now using the term. Um, 
we started using the term in the early 80s in the currency markets. And what it means is there's three or four large traders in any time zone in large instruments. And what you need to find out if you want to be a large speculator or a good speculator is where do those people leave their buy and sell orders? And if you can figure that out, then you can trade or swim with the whales. You can buy with me, sell with me. So here's another set of homework for all of you. Can you find my tracks, my whale tracks, on these CBOT corn charts? So I'm going to give you a series of charts. And this is daily CBOT corn. You can just look at my charts. You can just print out my charts. Or you can go to continuous corn and recreate them yourself. Here's a closer look of CBOT corn. And here's a finished look of CBOT corn. Well, it's not up to date at the moment. I mean, there's we dipped a little bit. Now we're right back up in the same area, by the way. And there you go. So here's the exercise for you. I made a huge trade in the corn using the same techniques. Now I've got some lines on here. You'll have to find the lines. They're not on here. The lines that I use to generate my trade. And see if you can figure out where Tim traded and when it's where Tim would exit, ex exit, what the risk reward is. See if you can figure out if you were me, what this trade should look like. See if you can diagram out. It's pretty pretty straightforward stuff. Those of you at Market Geometry, you can go ahead and send me work. If you're members, you know, you you actually watched this trade live. Actually, you watched one of the bean trades live as well. We we showed the entry before we got in. We showed the entry. Uh, we showed the exit. The exit. I was actually exiting during one of the sessions live. Um, <clears throat> so, if you're from Market Geometry, um, I'm going to deduct some points for your overall score, since you should be able to find this out. If you're not from Market Geometry, like I said, I'll talk to Cynthia and Barbara, and uh, maybe we'll do a presentation of what people saw and and, uh, and give something away um, if, if uh, compliance allows us. Otherwise, I'll just do it privately. But let's see if we can answer some questions. I know Cynthia's saying, "Oh my God, you're going to go forever, Tim." Hi, darling. Well, hello, Tim. No, I expected you to go even longer. This is great. Okay. But what I am going to do here, because it looks like you're coming to the end, and we are. Oh, I'm oh, going to the poll thing. Hang on. Uh, oh, okay. Stop. You can't do it unless I do this. Boys, you know, Cynthia does such a great job. Uh, I think really this is the best educational service for free there is anywhere, even not outside of the internet. When she does the poll, there's going to be this little area that says, you know, suggestions, et cetera, et cetera. Please put in there either, not my name, either webinar or Cynthia, please, because it helps her produce more of these and keep this project going. So please do this. All right, go ahead. You can <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for that plug. But what I am going to do, and you'll see I'm opening up a poll on your machine. Ivy's management does ask that I do this within uh, for each event to make sure that you're getting the information that you expect and relevant to your trading needs. So notice there are three short questions there. Two are multiple choice, and the center one has an input field for any of your comments or suggestions. I do review this with management on a weekly basis, so I appreciate any of your input here. Now, you'll notice there's a submit button in the lower right-hand corner. Once you make your choices, go ahead and click the submit. You have about 10 seconds left to complete the poll. Now, also, if you do have comments or suggestions and want to send it to me, you can always uh, let me know at webinars at interactivebrokers.com. Please go. Oh, poll just ended. So thanks, everyone. It really is extremely helpful. All right. Now, you can close that panel, notice uh, the polling panel has an X over on the right-hand side. If you simply use that X, you'll get back to your chat panel. And if you're not seeing chat, take a look at the bottom of that panel um, or our uh, panel section there. Simply locate the title bar and double-click to expand. That's a great place to start entering your questions for Tim.
All right, Tim, we've given you a breather, but now you're back on the hot seat again. Uh, want to handle, ready to handle some questions here. I think I probably spawn more questions than, pre than pre presentation, but we'll see. Go ahead. Have at me. You want me just to go at them? Or? Oh, yeah, go right ahead. I'll let you okay. uh, handle them as well. Um, and I want to thank everyone for holding your questions until now. It really is. Oh, it was helpful today. It makes a big difference because otherwise, you know, I say I'm not going to look, but it's really hard not to look. It's really hard. So I do appreciate it. Everybody is very patient. I appreciate it. Uh, presentation. The moment you walk out the door, Matt, the presentation will it'll say, do you want to download it? And if you miss that, by the way, all you have to do, you'll get a link in a couple hours that says you can you can review this so you can see the whole presentation. Again, it's, it's recorded. When you leave that, actually when you first go there, you have the chance to download the slides. When you leave it again, you can download them. It's, it's very, very simple. There's no way to miss. There's 900 ways to get the slides. Don't worry about it. And just in case, if I can put a plug in, there's also, they will be archived on the Interactive Brokers webinar site. Um, you'll simply need to go to the Industry Sponsored tab. You can actually filter by presenter name so you can see just all of Tim's presentations. And the notes link is included directly next to the recorded link. So, uh, We're getting quite we, a library, darling. Oh, we certainly are. And I'll, uh, and by the way, everyone, we've been doing this with Tim all year, um, and we're going to continue this series as well. Now, um, it's we do present them monthly, and it's usually the second Thursday of each month. So you may want to check our um, upcoming webinar schedule as well and sign up for any um, upcoming events. But also, remember, there's a whole library out there talking about quite a few of the CME uh, product suites. So Tim is a wonderful fount of information, but let's get back to your questions now. So take it away, Tim. Here's my first question. Are we going to do this in 2013, darling? I, absolutely. Say yes. Say yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, then we got to work on Barbara. <laughs> oh, yes. As long as you're willing to do this, we'll keep I'm coming gonna, back, and we've got that uh, date set aside for you every month. If, so. I'm, if I'm breathing, I'll do it. How's that? <laughs> I'm, that's a big deal. Okay. I, again, one last time. Thank all. I uh, thank all of you. I know three weeks ago we were going to do this, and something came up, and I appreciate Cynthia and Barbara and all of you um, just taking your time and, and, and letting. I listen. I don't want to present it unless I can give it full attention. Um, so let's let me see if I can go back and snag some of these. Ask some questions. Let's see. Um, yes, George, I'm in good health. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, oh, hey, how about this? You're going to get a first, Cynthia. My partner Shane and I were talking. He's got a gun to my head. Yes, I am now going to finish the Wild Wild West of Foreign Exchange or Wild Wild West of FX. Um, because the rules have changed so much, uh, gunslingers like me, we're gone. You can't do that anymore. It's against the law. But I'll tell you, for 20 years, we could rape, pillage, rob, and steal legally, and did. And uh, I'm going to just, and I'm going to name name people, you know, everybody from George Soros on down. I'm going to take everybody to the bank, including myself. I'm going to tell, tell it like it was, and it was a blast. It was a big. Uh, a big round of fun, and uh, yes, I'm going to put it out. Uh, we're Wiley would like to do it. I don't know if we're going to do it with Wiley or McGraw Hill, but we're we're going to do that, and um, we're going to put sections of it up with IB unless they want nothing to do with it. But I guarantee they want to. It's good fun. So. And while you're on FX, I also yeah. want to put a little bit of a teaser in because Tim will be handling FX in October, so we All know right. what's coming up on the schedule. So uh, now let's not skip over September because we'll be tackling uh, the medals uh, in September. On, we're working on medals right now, but you're going to love them too. We got a great medals presentation. All right. Oh, super! Let's get back to those questions. All right. So that's me talking about my favorite ladies. Never mind. Here we go. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm getting there. Hang on. And there's me fumbling with trying to dial in. Okay, here comes the questions. Okay. Um, okay. So, Scott McClendon, are you here? By the way, one of my one of my favorite friends, long long time part of market geometry. Um, um, yes, the modified shift median line are the major swing points. Our water circle. That's exactly right. And Scotty com, uh, correctly pointed out that um, if you look at the A to C pivot of a median line, let me see if I can find that. This is important. So we'll take our time. If you have to leave, I understand. You can always email questions 
timothymorridge at gmail.com or timothymorridge at marketgeometry.com. Let me get to a chart that's really easy to see here. And hi, Scotty Clinton McClendon. I haven't seen you in a while. Good to, good to hear from you. Okay. Let's go back to that first chart. I, you know what, Cynthia? If I knew where it was, I'd just grab it. But uh, So I hope I'm not making you guys nauseous. There we go. This point is your A pivot. This point is your C pivot. B pivot. Here's your C pivot. On a modified shift, you can tell what a modified shift is, and Scotty nailed it, by just going A to C and drawing a line. And that's where I got the concept of the maximum, maximum excursion, okay? And so that's a little tip for you. You go back a couple sessions, we talked about it in detail. Um, I don't remember, the, what we, I may think it might have been oil. But that's basically um, where the line of maximum excursion comes from. And on this soybean chart, it nailed this perfectly. You could have just done the modified shift. But you could have just connected the AC and just lived with it. That's all you needed to know, okay? Uh, let's see. Why modified? Isn't it just a, a shift median line? Well, a shift median line is just up 50%. See, this is where we get into trouble with people that don't know Dr. Andrews' line work very well. They don't understand the history behind it, and they don't know the difference. Shift median lines are just up, up 50%. Modified shifts are up 50% over 50%, which is what this is, and what you, which is what you're going to use 90% of the time. I would say it's okay to just not even learn about shift media lines. Uh, use them occasionally, but I almost never use them. Um, let's see. Um, would it be advisable to, to have taken a short trade at the first touch of the median line of the modified shift? Um, here's my problem with getting short. First of all, you're coming into, this is why we talked about the biologics. You're coming into the planting season. Do you really want to be short into the plant, or excuse me, yeah, you're coming into the field preparation and planting season. Do you want to be short into that? Yes, there's money to be made, but where's the risk? The risk is to the upside, and especially because we're making higher lows and higher lows and higher lows and higher lows. You know, we're grinding ourselves into this triangle here. It uh, doesn't necessarily make sense. In terms of getting short up here, I don't know that you want to get short on an upsloping line, you might want to see if you can find a downsloping line. There's another piece of homework for you. See if you can find a downsloping line that makes sense for a short. Otherwise, I wouldn't take the short. Um, da -da -da. Vlad, thank you for very, uh, it's a, just such a wonderful comment. Thank you very much. I won't even read it. You guys can read it if you want it on, on the replay. Um, then people are are letting me off the hook for not taking the trade. I don't know. I really don't have any excuse. Um, I, you know, one thing is for certain: if you don't feel well or you, or you don't feel right, don't trade. But you know, this was a heartache. Uh, let's pull this up to miss. That's as good as they get. And then to not take it. Aye, aye. Gerald King says he likes it. Uh, took out the coil absolutely, and this thing is ready to rock at that point. No doubt about it. And I just, you know, i got to tell you, I'm lucky that it came back to earth and gave me an opportunity because, oh, my God, what a miss. Now, if you do miss a trade like this, don't spend too much time spanking yourself. Just get over it. Because as you see, if I would have just moped around, I would have missed the next trade. And also, still have confidence in your work because you have to step up to the plate. This trade was just as gorgeous. And if you let missing this trade color your entire trading career for the next six months, look what you missed. Uh, so plan your trade, trade the plan, and if you miss it, take a few days off, clear your head, go back to work. Sometimes you'll get the second opportunity. As I said, I love the trade here. My partner Shane likes this trade better because it, price has already shown it's a tent by taking out highs. Well, you know, nothing wrong with either one of them. I, I would have loved to nail this one. I'm glad I nailed this one. How about that? And I didn't have and as as let's see, I pointed this out. You know, I didn't have to sit through this. Yeah, I often do when I portfolio trade, but I didn't have to, so that was also pleasant. So um what's my take on scalping? Well, T J if you're still here, um if you can define a little better what I what you mean by scalping. For example, I do day trade. The problem with uh, my schedule, 
you know, I teach at MIT and several other universities using virtual classrooms. I also teach uh, fifth graders in a program. About we're at about fifteen thousand fifth graders this year. Um, I teach at Market Geometry. The only venue I do free, of course, is with the CME Group and IB, because I don't have any other time. And this probably takes a good fifteen hours of preparation to do each month. I, and it's a labor of love, don't get me wrong, but it takes up a lot of time. Put all that together, I have two young teenagers, I have a lovely wife, and um, I have I got plenty of things going on. I'm trading for four sovereign wealth funds. I'm one of the largest traders in the world, so I have plenty of things to do. Um, so I do day trade. Generally in a week, I get three or four hours on a Tuesday and three or four hours on a Wednesday. The rest of the days, and those are built into my schedule for day trading, the rest of the days... Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So I have to trade when I can, other than portfolio trading. Portfolio trading is different. I put my orders in at 4.30 in the evening. I don't look at the market after that, and then I check the next day to see what orders are filled. So let's see. Are the speculators short-timers with shallow pockets and the whales long-term with deep pockets? TJ, um, I'm actually a speculator. I'm, I'm in, in private circles. I'm known as one of the largest speculators in the world. Um, I'm a speculator. I'm proud to say that I'm a speculator. Okay, I don't care what the president or Congress or anybody else will say. I make my money speculating in all kinds of markets, not just commodity markets, not just foreign exchange, although that's my first love, but I trade things like sovereign debt, all kinds of strange things. I'll speculate in anything that fluctuates, anything that moves. Speculators are not good, bad things. They're good things. Um, now, the difference is there are, there are different sizes of speculators. I wasn't always this large. I've cornered four different markets in my career, um, and been a part of corners in what they call agencies uh, uh, prior to that several times. But most of my money is just made like this, trying to catch a major swing. Smaller speculators, um, they can be as small as one lots. If you make the majority of your living, or if you make money living trading, you're speculating. Um, you can call it anything you want, and if it bothers you, if the word speculator bothers you, call yourself a trader. But you're really, if you think about it, if you're making money, you're speculating. That's all. Let's see. Um, where did I put my stop in the soybeans? Yeah, a few ticks off the bottom. You can take a look. It's 50. You just take a look at the chart. I used a 55-point stop, and it's underneath uh, a swing, and I believe there are double bottoms. I think you're actually correct. Um, on the wheat diamond chart, how did you determine the distance between upsloping reaction lines? Well, let's take a look. I'm literally, I draw this in. This is my first line. Well, look, we go to a cleaner chart. Yeah, there we go. Do I have one without any bias on it? There we go. This was my first doodle. I mean, you should think about them this way. These, when Dr. Anders did his work in the mid-1920s at MIT, he had a group of graduate students. And he had Dr. Anderson, who was the head of the mathematics department, and he had Roger Babson, who ran for president later on and was also a speculator, made a fortune in the 1907 crash. Anders and Babson made a fortune in the 1929 crash. In the mid-20s, Dr. Anders put together, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Anders and Dr. Anderson put together a group of graduate students. Dr. Anders had just graduated from MIT with his doctorate, and he was a thermodynamics professor, and um, he wanted to further work on energy as it related to the markets. And so he put together this study group of students, locked them in a room, literally, gave them yellow sheets of paper. Remember back then we didn't have calculators, we didn't have computers, so you had pencils and yellow pads of paper. I actually own that, that work, lead pencils on paper. I have reams and reams and reams of it. And... Um, what they did was they did all this work looking at energy and frequency. And the first thing they found was action-reaction lines. So they saw they draw a center line, which would be this, which carries frequency. And then they would go back and find action. And by action here, they would take a look. You can see here it's grabbing. You can see the run lower. And then we do the switchback. We come, we zoom through it, then we pull back, and then we collapse. So that's our first marker. Then when we pull back up, so here's our first pull back up after zooming through. Here's our retest. Andrew said that price would zoom through, 
and then retest. And here's our zoom through and our retest, and it catches the retest. So we're going to run this through, and you can see it grabs its bottom nicely. It doesn't have to catch the exact bottom, but you can see these are one or two, three bars fluff. And then we're back out. So this is the stretch or the extreme. So we're cutting through the center. That's fine. And then right here, this is probably zooming through. And as long as you grab the zoom, that's fine. So it's grabbing the majority of this action. And that gave my equidistant. I put it out here in case I needed it. I put it out here to see if we got grab frequency. And it's still do go, doing a good job. Grabs bottoms here, near the tops here. And you can see it's not the exact top, but take a look. We're violating it by the same distance here, so it's still got frequency. Now the poke higher is exact. Now we're bouncing around it as we test it. We come out. As we come back down, you see it's still important. Look at it up here. So there's lots to like about here. This line is just off the highest high. If I had done it off of this high, it actually probably would have been equidistant. Same thing up here. If you put this line in right here, which I didn't for clarity, you can see that this line gives this line, gives this line. You can create these yourself and take a look at them. And I don't, again, I very seldom show diamond work. It's, it's about 20% art, 80% science, but that 20% art is really, really big. And if I were you, I would start with median lines, and if you want to create diamonds, I would start with upsloping and downsloping median lines so that you do have lines of opposing force. And generally when I trade, I do have an upsloper and a downsloper going, at least one set of each. And that'll give you a feel, and then you can branch off. Median lines didn't come around until the 1940s when Andrews realized the mathematical probabilities of A, B, C, and found that 90% of the time it still gave the same frequency or the same slope. So it's a shorthand way of learning and teaching median lines. Uh, let's see. Hey, Scotty B. Um, Summer says, when creating, I hope you're still here, Summer. Um, when creating diamonds, it seems like you can choose a lot of lines with slightly different slopes. There you go. See, there's the problem with diamonds. That's why I would start with median lines. You nailed it on the head. Do you have specific rules of how the multi-pivot lines are drawn? Um, yeah, the big rule is practice. I'd like, I, everybody wants, and Summer, you know this, everybody wants a black and white answer, and you can't, I, I'd love to give it to you. And I, I know if I was at uh, imanexperttrader.com or something, I would lie to you and say that here's the A, B, and C answer, and if you do this and pay me five ninety nine a month, et cetera, et cetera, it's not like that. And, you know, I showed you some of my mistakes today. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's work. It's learning the, the process. It's not something you can do in six weeks. This is a, Learning how to do this is a university course in and of itself, as is money management. Trading is not easy. It's easy to lose your money, but it's very hard to learn to trade well. I know most of you don't want to hear that, and that's why I'm not the most popular guy in the world, but uh, I don't think there's anybody that can say that I'm not truthful. Um, it's difficult. So here's what I'd say, Summer. This line caught my eye. I put it on there, and I left it alone. Then I came back, and I, I literally, you know, if you're doing it on a computer stream, this is really easy. Just grab it and copy it and just kind of march it through the chart and say, does this make any sense to me? If it's off, let's say you drew it like this, and you grab this bottom here so it's sloped like this. When you got over here, you'd say, you know, this isn't exactly right. I need to change the slope. So you page it through the chart. If you're doing it um, like I am by drawing hand charts, and I doubt any of you are doing hand charts, and I don't recommend you do hand-drawn charts, it's more difficult. But if you do it on a computer, you can take this line and copy it, just kind of walk it through, and just see whether or not it's pleasing or makes sense. That really cuts learning time down. The computers have really done a good job of that. Same thing on the downside. I started this is, I started the downside. Now let's look at the upside. I grabbed something. I just grabbed the major low. There's no ma this one is really not magic at all somewhere. I grabbed the major low and the first reaction low, connected them. That gave me the slope. Then I marched it through and said, yay, this has got good frequency. Now you just have to find the distance between it. It's not really that hard. Just page it through and you'll see it. So there's a little bit of the tips. There you go. Um, let's see. Action, reaction. Well, uh, Regis, I hope I said your name right. Can you please elaborate on action, reaction? The choice of upsloping center lines is fine, but how do you choose the upsloping action point? What is the logic of choosing the action point? Um, 
Again, here's my line. Major low, major low. I just run it through the chart. If you don't find this one, here's a tip for you. Keep running it out. Major high, major high. Runs through the right area. Now I've got equidistant. I can bisect it and find this one. So this is the art part. I wish I could tell you, and if you just grabbed this line instead of this side, you would have had the equidistant all the way around, by the way. But that's the art part. I wish I could tell you that it's as simple as do this, then do this. That will give you this. It's not that simple. I'm sorry. It's not. That's why median lines were invented, because median lines are as simple as A, B, C. Action reaction lines are a little more work. That's all. Do I have a presentation with your mistakes in trading or drawing median lines uh, from Robert? You know, Robert, if I did all my mistakes, uh, Cynthia, you'd have to give me a year, maybe two. Um, I, I try and show uh, mistakes that are relevant. Um, this has been, this has been a, as a portfolio trader, and that's mostly what we show here because it's what we're doing. Maybe in FX I'll try and do something a little, short, a little shorter term in October. But uh, when we portfolio trade, you know, when I talk about portfolio trading, I have to tell you, I'm on a two, and a, maybe two and a half, maybe three years. Um, I haven't had a loser in my portfolio trades, and I don't trade that often. I'll trade five to seven times in the spring and five to seven times in the fall. But I'm waiting for the axe to fall, and there's going to be a heck of a lot of losers when I get on a losing streak. Because you do come back to your mean. My long-term profitability. I'm 66% profitable winning percentage. Um, so I'm not going to stay at 100%. No one's going to be at 100%. I'm going to come down to 66%, which means I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to be down around 40%, 50% profitable to get back down to my long-term average. And I have no illusions that will happen. But I just happen to have hit some markets that have been, I think, um, right up my alley, so to speak. We've had these big, broad trends in the grains and oil and, you know, some of the, and you know, gold and some of the other things, right, copper. And uh, if you're patient, you know, they've been pretty lucrative in the last three years or so. But, you know, the mistakes will come. Uh, when I make the original lines for the diamonds, are you going by price touches on the line to determine what frequency? Yes. Um, and that's from Gerald. Hey, Gerald, how you doing? Yeah, it's mostly price touches, highs and lows, and or the way it cuts through, for example, the way it slices. See this? You can see the frequency. Look at the slope in this little wedge right here. You can see that that line belongs right where it is. And especially if you grab this low and this low and then run into that wedge, it's pretty easy to say, okay, it's right here, and you project it forward, and then you go, hey, look, it grabs these two highs. That's pretty simple stuff. Uh, let's go. Um, hey, Scotty. Hope you're still here. Good to see you. Uh, Vlad, do me a favor. You're asking about uh, transaction topics could, from selling to buying. Do me a favor. Could you clarify and or send me an email if you don't, um, if you don't want to do it here so I understand exactly what you're doing? What data feed am I using? Sorry, Robert. I'm using eSignal. Um, I noticed you entered on a straight limit order instead of a test and retest that you previously. Okay, uh, Paul. The reason why I did not use a test and retest in this particular example, I almost always find you know I, I test and retest is my favorite entry, but I find in the grains that and you saw it in the wheat for example. I find in the grains, and if you do your homework correctly in the corn, you'll see the same thing. That. Um, I generally get one, about 70% of the time, I get one bar. On that day, if I have my order in, I can buy, if I'm going long, I can buy all the grains that I want to buy. And usually by the end of the day, I'm 30, the prices are closing, if I'm right, 30 or 40 cents higher from where I was buying. But boy, for half the day, there are no buyers other than me. And then the next day, price is nowhere near where I was buying, if I'm right. Otherwise, I'm going to get, actually, if it's back by the third day, I'm generally going to get stopped out. So tests and retests don't work very well for me in the grain markets. Now, they work sometimes. And um, my partner, Shane, called me on it um, in, I want to say, the second, 
corn entry. You take a look. It's either the first or second corn entry. And there's a beautiful test and retest. And um, so it does happen. But I tend to use straight entries right at the line and limit limit buy orders. Nothing fancy at all. In the grains, I tend to not use test and retest, just so you know. Um, how did you know to think that the target was going to go outside the diamond to the upper level? Well, actually, if, here, here's the thing. I'm, you know what? I, I didn't have a an image of the rest of the diamonds, but I'll leave this for you to draw out. And who is this? This is Matt. If you if you extend the diamonds, the diamonds keep going. If you extend the diamonds out, extend the upsloping diamond and down and the and and the downsloping diamonds, you'll see why my profit target is where it is. I'll, I'll let you go ahead and finish it up. Just take this chart. You can recreate it. Um, here's here's a great and and the other reason, by the way, the easiest reason is it's a test of the prior highs. That hey, if I can take that amount of money, there should be some sellers here at prior highs, hedgers, people that are, have grain silos, farmers. They're willing to sell up in here because they missed it the last time. This is one great reason, but there's also a reason basis of the diamonds. So I'll let you see if you can figure that out. Um, let's see. The Greek government... Oh, no, no, I, think, no, I don't think I was supposed to read that one live. Sorry, Jen. I'll leave that one out. I love the Greek government. Never mind. Um, Sylvester, I'm going to answer, I'm gonna answer this uh, uh, publicly. I'm not going to use your last name. I have a question that bothers me sometimes. Aren't you afraid that the more people that know median lines, the harder it will be to earn based on them? Is there any risk everyone will use them and they will lose power? My last reckoning, um, I did a little research. Um, I made a presentation at the Sloan Business School um, at MIT ooh, two years ago. And I enlisted some of their graduate students afterwards. And we did a, we did a question and answer session with a number of hedge fund managers, CTAs, and large speculators, um, several thousand people. Our conclusion was less than 99 percent, or sorry, less than 1 percent uh, of the market knew anything or cared anything about median lines. So we're the, one, we're the only ones using sloping lines, and even less of those people know anything about diamonds. Um, so yeah, I mean, you are seeing more. I will say this. Remember, I started this all by my lonesome self in 1995. Dr. Andrews died in 1987. The technique was gone, dead, forgotten. And I didn't want his legacy to end that way. Um, at that point, I started to just try and give back to the community. And um, I was post we didn't, email was not around by the when, web, by the when, by the way, hadn't been invented. Websites were not invented. Um, this was on a CompuServe forum. And I started putting out charts with median lines on them. And people were like, what is this? Well. I mean, you start. You are now starting to see them on, you know, Bloomberg, CNBC, and places like that. Not that they know what they're doing, but median lines are showing up. But these people have no idea what they're doing. Um, the people that there are other people that give um, educational seminars that show median lines. Again, they don't know what they're doing. I'm sorry, and it, and I do my best to dispel the myths that are out there. Um, there just there's just nobody else left from Dr. Andrews' days that are teaching. Um, I'm really not worried. Price is going to go where it's going to go. And we're not, you know, people ask me, do you think price turned because you were buying weed at this point? Well, price turned here just fine without me, didn't it? I think price is going to do what it's going to do with or without you. I don't really worry about it. I think I think price has an agenda, irregardless of whales or how many people are involved, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really not worried about it. One thing I learned early on in trading uh, when I was a large market maker was, even when there are large orders, price seeks those orders out anyway. It's not afraid of anybody. So, not worry about it. It's okay. Um, Vlad, I don't know what a what you mean. What kind of resonator you're talking about? But go ahead and let me know. I, I if if you clarify, I, you know, remember, Dr. Andrews wouldn't touch any computer including PCs. We tried to give him a PC in his house, and he would only basically use lines. Um, he was even kind of iffy about slide rules, if you can believe that. Um, okay. 
Using these three sets of median lines and following Andrew's basic rules, you were able to create an imaginary fork, yep, and map out the probable path of price. That was really cool and clearly explained. You made it look very simple and doable. Thumbs up. Well, it, it, it is, I don't want to make it look too simple, but yeah, it's very doable. If you, The biggest thing is you have to let some of your uh, preconceived notions go. I actually had a mentoring session. I do teach private traders. Uh, I have some professional traders and, and, and just some individual speculators as well. And I was teaching somebody yesterday, and I did something in the 20-minute Aussie. And not only did I teach them how to do exactly what I showed you today, in the 20-minute Aussie I showed them how to pick the C point. This was on 20 minutes, three days before the C point arrived. But I also showed them how this is a wash and rinse how a wash and rinse is formed, how to protect yourself against the wash and rinse, and how to predict it four or five bars before it happens. And if you're a whale, why you would have it, why you would wash and rinse the area so that you would then have the opportunity to take a position away from everybody else, all live. So once you see it and once you drop the preconceived notions, um, now I've been doing this a long time. I don't want to, I'm not telling you, you know, again, again I, I trade magnificently.com, 599, come do it. That's not what I'm talking about. It takes work. It takes practice. But if you can think outside the box and relax, there's, there's a lot of things in the market that you can see. And the market really does move to market geometry. It's really pretty simple uh, concept-wise. And then you just have to apply them. But it is neat. I agree. Uh, let's see. I trade just two years, and I was trying uh, lots of methods, but everything didn't work for me. Oh, thank you so much. Tim Morgan is the first person who shows me the right way in trading. Well, Vlad, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's an art, not a science. I, I, I would agree with that. I think there's an awful lot of art in this. Do I trade the E-mini S&Ps? Yes, I do, David. Um, Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, not mistakes. Good trades sometimes don't work. That's why you have stops. Absolutely. Remember, even if you're the best in the world, and I'm one of them, you're, you're wrong at least a third of the time, maybe more. In fact, if you're 50-50 and had good risk-reward, you're still doing darn good and you'll make lots of money. How about that? So if your risk reward's better than 3 to 1, you're at 50-50. You'll make lots of money. Um, do I use the same techniques, median lines of diamond? Sure, I'm showing you actual trades. These are actual trades. This is exactly how I trade. I've given you a little more insight than I normally do um, for two reasons today. Uh, one, diamonds I normally don't show. Uh, but it was such a neat trade, and you saw me fumble the ball, which is, you know, always good for you guys to see professionals uh, stumble. And then I, you show me, go, you see me going back to the well and saying, okay, I know my methodology, I know my trading, I'm going to enter here, and it worked. Um, but second of all, if you do the homework, you'll be actually looking at exactly those are my working trades. Those aren't something that I made for the IB presentation. Let's go to those. There, these are. This is my. This is. This is, I'm drawing, doing this, looking for a trade. Now, I'm not going to show you the, the uh, lines that spawn the trade. I want you to find it. But this is my actual working chart. This is not something I did for this presentation. This is from my, I have an arch archive with 20 terabytes of data worth of charts. And this is directly out. This is me documenting my trades. So do I ever just exit a profitable trade based on something you see before it even gets close to a median line target, and what observations can you point to for that decision to exit, or do you just let your stop get hit? Actually, Vernon, um, I, I make a plan. Oh, you, see, you saw me stub my toe. I, I'd be a liar if I told you that I didn't sometimes screw up. Um, you saw me stub my toe in the wheat, and I passed on it. Um, but I showed you that because I wanted to show you how important it is to follow your plan. But in general, I'll follow my plan, I'll follow it religiously, and your last statement is exactly right. Do you just let your stop get hit? Yep, I do. Because too many times in the past, and I'm talking about 15, 20 years ago, I've tried to be cute, and I've said, you know, oh, if it drifts five bars outside the median line, I'll, I'll just get out. Well, it'll drift five bars outside, I'll get out, and then it'll do what it's supposed to do. So I just go with my plan now. And if it, that's what stops are for. My stops get hit, that's okay. We call that rolling forward stops. When I'm profitable, you know, if I have uh, a trade here where I made uh, six to one risk reward, that means I rolled forward six stops. I can be wrong six times. I'm still playing with the market's money. That's why it's important. Um, let's see. Data source for Ensign. Yes, I push e-signal into Ensign, Robert. So that's my data source. Okay. And it's in grains. It would be con 
e signals continuous, which is unadjusted month to month. Have you ever done a study as to how often probability price seeks out energy points? Yes, about uh, 70 70 percent, Jason. Um, I, I, I'll look and give you an exact number. It's lower than 80 percent, which is the median line, but it's it's very close. Um, and you have to give it some on both sides. In other words, it's not exact. It's it's a measure of volatility to the left or right of the energy point, but it, it's very accurate. Um, I'm going to read what Sharon says. I'm a student of Tim and Shane's. Shane's my partner, by the way. And they look at many other parts of market structure, not just media lines. Absolutely. We'll, we look at um, all kinds of different observations, and we try and put it all together. And by looking at market structure, so for example, swing highs, swing lows, swing highs, swing lows, swing highs, swing lows. Here I've marked swing highs and swing lows. This is a gap, which leaves me an area that's extremely important. Me major high secondary high, first pullbacks, all those things, that's market structure. If you look at those, that, it, that makes it much easier to decide how to draw median lines, how to draw the correct center line. And so we, we go over that in detail in market, in market geometry, um, and we give lots of homework. We answer questions all day long. Um, Shane, is, you know, I waited uh, almost all my career to take a part. He's a wonderful guy. He studied with me for 10 years first, but he's, he's a magnificent teacher. Um, he's a magnificent chartist. The two of us together are much better than two people. You know, uh, the two of us equal three, I think. And uh, we, just have, we just have a ball working together. So thank you for the comment, Sharon. Um, yeah, we have all kinds of advanced seminars, Vlad. Um, did you close your ES position? Uh, Robert, I didn't have an E-mini position yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 don't, I don't know what you're referring to, but um, generally when I trade E-mini S&Ps, I'm day trading. Um, yesterday was Tuesday, but um, I was mentoring yesterday, and uh, also um, actually my, my son is out of school ill, so I was taking care of him. And when things like that happen, here's what I do. I don't trade. I take care of uh, what I have to take care of. So I actually wasn't watching the market yesterday at all. Um, is there a repeatable relationship between the number of speculators and hedgers related in this, in this, to the seasons? No, there, there isn't. Um, unfortunately not, or just be a little bit easy. Um, um, you guys can read what Sharon and some other people are, are saying about what we teach in market geometry. But we have a lot of fun there, and um, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for people. It's just there to educate people. That's all. Uh, Vernon reminds me to trade the plan. That's exactly right. You got it, Vernon. Let's see. Uh, Vernon says, I'm using median lines religiously, but I'm having trouble sticking with the trades that are often correct. Well, there you go. That's golden. Have a plan, trade the plan. You, you're absolutely right, Vernon. Vernon, the biggest part in trading, the hardest part to master in trading is to master yourself. If you can get rid of the emotions, if you can, well, once you understand what's going on in the market, if you can figure out what you're going to do and then do it, that's it. Just take the losses when they come. Use good risk reward. You're you're just absolutely golden. That's what Amos taught me, and it's made a huge difference in my life. Um, Dr. Andrews did not teach any type of money management. Um, I, I, you know, after being around him for more than 15 years, I don't really think it entered much in his decision making. Um, Amos was exactly the opposite. Money management was golden. It was the rule. In fact. Uh, once I finish the Wild Wild West, I'm going to do something with Amos's work because there's nothing out there at all, unfortunately. So um, let's see. One who makes 10%. Oh, my God. Here you go. Um, Ahmad said, one who makes 10% return on investment per month regularly on a demo account but cannot duplicate that in real-time account needs. Okay. First of all, we have to understand what return on investment means. You have to measure the unleveraged instrument. So if it's the E-mini S&Ps, you have to understand that it's about $100,000. Actually, it's $140,000. So you have to measure your gains against $140,000, not the size of your account, to get return on investment. Second of all, if you could make 10% a month, that means you'd be making 120% a year uncompounded which means you more than double your money every year. So 
If you leave that money in your account, I can do the math in my head, something like six years from now you will have be making the GDP of America. Um, let's just be realistic. Nobody is going to double their money every year, period. The best speculator I know in terms of actual massive rates of return is a gentleman by the name of Richard Dennis, good longtime friend. Richard can make three or four hundred percent a year, but he also goes bankrupt. That's his trading style. He shoots for the moon every time he trades. Um, I'm not saying anything that's not public, and I don't mean it in a mean way. If I had to have somebody trade my money for a massive rate of return, it would be Richard. It wouldn't be me. I trade for consistent profitability. But if you look at average rates of return, if you're a large head fund manager, if you can make 15 to 25 percent a year and have drawdowns of 10 percent or less, you're just the best in the world as good as they get. Um, so first thing you need is realistic goals. You should not try and be making 10% return on real investment in terms of the actual investment. Instead, you should be trying to make a relative nice rate of return. Then you should only be risking less than 1.5% of your account on any trade. Um, I'm not going to get into all of it now, but the idea basically is if you if you limit the number of losers in a row, if you then keep your losses to a standard minimum amount and say, I only lose X and then I will always have a stop that's that size or smaller, and then you start to trade and make consistent money, you slowly grow your account. That's how you become a consistent speculator. The problem is most people want to trade and trade and trade. They want to trade five times a day, seven times a day. I've had people that come into mentoring that trade 20 times a day. And yeah, on a, on a simulator you can do it. And you might even be able to do it for a few days here and there. But in terms of day in and day out, not going to happen. So you need to slow down. You need to find the pace that fits you. You need to find the market time frame that fits you. You need to find the market that works with you. You need to slow down and learn market structure and some sort of line work that works for you. Put it all together, slow down, relax, and trade on leverage, you actually will begin to make money, in my opinion. Unless you have a character flaw. Um, yeah, here's some of do. The hardest thing about trading uh, uh, is mastering yourself. Thank you. I absolutely agree. Audio is bad. That's right, BJ, you know what I'm saying. Shoot for 30% a year, and you're the top group of CTAs in the world. You're absolutely right, Matt. That's right. Tim, your primary decision based just on market structure or you use something else? Well, it's market structure, market geometry, whether it's action, reaction lines, or median lines. And then I won't take a trade if it has bad risk reward or too large a stop. All those together, that's what makes it a trade. Hey, Ouija, how are you? Um, true, hey, there you go, Robert says, true leverage kills. Absolutely, you're absolutely right, Robert. Um, in fact, what we say is, you have to earn the right to trade larger. Um, I think we're, are we running low here? Did I hit them all, Cynthia? I think so. Quick. Uh, that's right. I think so, Tim. Well, while we're waiting, I'll give everyone an, another couple of um, moments to add any additional questions. But that is bringing us to the end of today's event. I have to thank Tim Morge for your generosity today in bringing us the presentation and um, uh, giving us all of your undivided attention today. That is absolutely tremendous. So thank you so much, Tim. I do want to remind everyone that uh, we have been recording today's event and we'll actually be sending everyone a copy of today's recording. Uh, it normally takes a couple of hours after the event, so watch your email if you do want to come back and review any of the concepts that Tim discussed. And speaking of reviewing those concepts and the homework that Tim did assign, those webinar notes or the slides that Tim has used today will actually pop up as you leave today's session. So look for that additional browser. If you happen to miss it, don't worry. It will be posted by the end of the day on the Interactive Broker site. Underneath the Education menu, there's a webinars link. Um, go to the Recordings and Industry-Sponsored Events where you can uh, filter for Tim Morge and find uh, <clears throat> 
uh, today's presentation replay as well as those webinar notes. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions come in other than bravo, and I have to say that as well. But I also want to <clears throat> express a great deal of thanks to the CME group. It's their dedication for me, uh, to education that's made today's event possible. So um, <clears throat> uh, kudos to the CME for putting us together with Tim Morge. So thanks. Um, I see a couple more questions, so I'll give you a quick uh, moment to go ahead and answer those. Tim, but thank you so much. Cynthia, it's, you know what? Again, thanks for being patient. I, I know you. We were dancing on ice there uh, three weeks ago, but um, we got here. It's it, hopefully it's gone well, and uh, we have uh, a ton of people. And I appreciate everybody being patient. Let me grab a couple here. Um, David says, <laughs> David, this is a good problem. I must have a problem. I made 18 percent on my account thanks to the Aussie the last two months, and thanks to you. Okay. I keep my risk at 2% always. What's wrong? There's nothing wrong, David. But look, let me just say what I said before. I'm on a three-year winning streak in portfolio trading. Three years. Nothing wrong with that, but I, I don't expect that I'm going to be at 100% for the rest of my life. I know I'm going to come back to earth. Let me just tell you, David, and I, I know you've been uh, religious at market geometry and learning, um, at, at going up the learning curve very fast, and you're doing very well. Don't forget, the Aussie has been, in fact, when we get to the FX in October. We're, I guarantee you we're going to be covering the Aussie. The last two or three months in the Aussie has been just magnificent. There have been trades every day of the week. Uh, short, long, doesn't matter. They've just been at, and Canada has been great. They're, they're, some of the currency markets have just been magnificent this summer. So nothing wrong with that. But you know what? Don't get spoiled. Don't expect to be making 18% the rest of your career. Not going to happen. Um, be, enjoy it while it lasts. Hopefully, uh, David, I hope you... I hope you prove me wrong and that you own the United States in three years, but I don't think it's going to happen. It doesn't mean you're going to fall apart. It just means, you know, you're trading at the top of your game. Enjoy it. Um, let's see. Uh, Han says he likes my my uh, <laughs> my calm, uh, non-hectic way of speaking. My son tells me that I learned to, I should learn to have some emotion. Um, anyway. Matt says, 91 trades, good job. Yeah, good. that's right, David. That's exactly right. He's doing a good job. Um, Pat, that's BJ. Uh, good, to, good to see you. How you doing? Um, um, you know what, Jack? You, I, you, my results, I was a public trader. Um, I managed money publicly for about seven years, and three out of those seven years, uh, one year I was the best rate of return um, um, as managed by risk, and I was always in the top ten, and three out of those ten years I was in the top five. And I was always available. I'm still registered um, on the NFA list, uh, market, mar excuse me, the National Futures Association. Um, but my returns are no longer public, and the reason why is because I manage money for four sovereign wealth funds, which means four countries. Um, that's not in their best interest. They really don't want it interested. So, uh, but that being said, you, you can go and look. There's, there's no nick on my record. I'm I'm upfront about everything, and um, you can talk to people in the marketplace. Um, I, I am what I say I am. You know what? You should be able to tell it by the presentations. If you can't, then I'm not doing a good job. Uh, Vernon says, emotion plus trading equals bad. Yes, I agree. So, for example, yesterday, my son had to come home. I had to go pick him up. I'm not going to trade. He comes home, I'm going to sit down and take care of him. I'm not going to trade. Not going to happen. Um, hey, Scotty. Um, I, th I think that's it, Cynthia. I think we're good. Well, wow. A terrific afternoon spent with Tim Moore. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, and it's late where you are. I'm ready to go home. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> there's still some of the trading day left. Uh, now, another reminder, everyone, that we're going to be doing this again with Tim on September 13th. I don't have that session posted yet, but I'm hoping to be able to by the end of this week. So um, mm. do be aware. I'm to get that description. <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? Actually, we have uh, Cynthia and our, uh, Barbara and I already have the first draft finished, and I promised her after, as soon as I wrap this up, I will go get the second draft. So you should have it shooting very soon. Oh, very good. Right. Yes, and... And but I just do want to let everyone know that we are doing this regularly on the second Thursday of every single month. So if you don't see it now, wait a couple of days and check again, um, and simply register. That's right, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, this has been terrific. Thank you so much, Tim. And for everyone else, as you leave the event, simply use the X in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Thanks all. We'll see you in just a few weeks. Uh, <clears throat> please join us again. Thanks everyone, and thank you very much. Much Tim as well. Have a great afternoon and everyone trade smart. Thanks.
Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you in a couple weeks. Take care.